contribute to our society are most welcome here and that we would expect that welcome to continue as Scotland remains in the EU. Thank you. We now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on the bedroom tax, discretionary housing payments. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Nicola Sturgeon, Deputy First Minister, 10 minutes. Uh, Presiding officer, in light of correspondence that I received from the UK Government on Friday, I wanted to take an early opportunity to update Parliament on the Scottish Government's plans to fully mitigate the impacts of the bedroom tax on the 72,000 families across Scotland who are affected by it. The Scottish Government has been consistent in our view that the only legal way to make regular and ongoing payments directly to tenants to compensate them for the loss of housing benefits suffered as a result of the bedroom tax is through discretionary housing payments administered by local authorities. We have also been clear that the cost of fully mitigating the bedroom tax would be up to £50 million a year. As members are aware, councils will receive £15 million this year from the DWP to spend on discretionary housing payments, leaving a potential shortfall of £35 million on the funding required to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. As members are also aware, uh, John Swinney made this additional £35 million available in the Scottish Government's budget for this year, with the express intention of fully mitigating the impact of this tax. £20 million of this additional funding has already been allocated to councils. I can advise Parliament that the distribution of this money between councils was agreed at the COSLA leaders meeting on the 25th of April. This agreement allows us to target the funding as much as possible according to need. And I'm happy to confirm that as a result, 12 councils already have the funds they need to fully mitigate the bedroom tax in their local areas. The remaining 20 councils have been allocated funding up to the limit of the Westminster imposed cap on how much each council is allowed to spend on discretionary housing payments. However, this still leaves them short of what they need to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. The remaining £15 million that the Scottish Government has set aside is intended to make up this shortfall, but it cannot be provided to local authorities until the DHP cap is lifted. That's why I wrote to Ian Duncan Smith, Secretary of State for Working Pensions, on the 31st of January, asking him to lift the cap on DHPs, a move, I should say, that will cost the DWP absolutely nothing. Since then, we've written on a further five occasions. I also raised the issue personally with the Deputy Prime Minister at the Joint Ministerial Committee in London. I'm grateful to the convener of the Welfare Reform Committee, who wrote to the DWP in similar terms, and to a number of organisations outside this parliament, including COSLA, who have been making the same demand of the DWP. Presiding officer, it is fair to say that the delay in receiving a response from the UK government has been deeply frustrating. Of course, while pressing for an answer, we've also been considering an alternative method of getting money to those who need it. But it has always been the case that DHPs are the best and the most effective means of doing so. I was therefore pleased to finally receive a positive response from David Mundell, the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Scotland, on Friday, in which he stated, and I quote, I'm aware that the Scottish Government has indicated that it would like to spend additional funds on DHPs in Scotland. I'm writing to you today to offer to provide Scottish ministers with a power to set the statutory cap in Scotland. I propose to do so using Section 63 of the Scotland Act 1998. Presiding officer, it's important to stress, as I think will be obvious from the quote I've just read out, that the UK government has not agreed to lift the cap, but instead to transfer powers to Scottish ministers to allow us to do so. I welcome that, but it does mean that the legal process to effect the transfer of power will have to be completed before the Scottish government can then lay an order to actually lift the cap. As members will appreciate, that two-stage process will take longer than would have been the case had the UK government decided to lift the cap itself. It's therefore vital that we move to get the process underway and completed as soon as possible. Section 63 of the Scotland Act 1998 provides an order-making power for the transfer of executive functions from UK ministers to Scottish ministers. In this case, it is proposed to transfer to the Scottish Government executive responsibility for the exercise of the power contained in the Child Support, Pensions and Social Security Act 2000 to vary the DHP cap. 
The procedure for making uh, a Section 63 order is set out in the Scotland Act. Firstly, the terms of a draft order require to be agreed between the Scottish and the UK governments. The order then requires to be laid before both parliaments for agreement and ultimately it has to be considered and approved by the Privy Council. I have written to David Mundell to accept the UK Government's offer to transfer the power and to indicate that my officials will work with UK Government officials on the detail of the order. I can also advise Parliament that I will be meeting with David Mundell tomorrow to discuss the draft order and the timescales for agreeing its final terms, for laying it before both Parliaments and for having it considered by the Privy Council. I will uh, undertake to write to MSPs as soon as I can to provide an update on the likely timescales for each stage of that process, including, of course, the parliamentary scrutiny stage and, indeed, the timescale for the completion of that process. When the Section 63 order has taken effect, Scottish ministers will then be able to lay an order varying or lifting the cap on DHPs. We will ensure that this order allows the entirety of the £50 million that is available to be utilised. We will also ensure that the order is laid as quickly as possible. Presiding officer, although there is, uh, as I'm sure members will appreciate, still much work to be done to ensure that this process is completed both smoothly and quickly, it is important today to stress that local authorities should now plan on the basis that all losses of housing benefit incurred by social tenants due to the bedroom tax can be fully mitigated. 35 million of the available funding has already been allocated. As I said earlier, 12 councils already have sufficient funds to fully mitigate the bedroom tax in their own areas. And those councils still with a shortfall can now plan on the basis that that shortfall will be met in full. I will shortly respond to a letter from the President of COSLA to give local authorities these reassurances in writing. And I can assure Parliament that we will start working with COSLA immediately to ensure a distribution of the remaining funds that will get the money to where it is needed in order that the bedroom tax is fully mitigated in every local authority area in Scotland. I want today to encourage local authorities to review their own discretionary housing payment procedures to ensure that there are no unnecessary barriers to tenants applying for a DHP. And the point about encouraging and enabling tenants to apply for DHPs is a very important one. What the Scottish Government is able to do is mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax. Unfortunately, we are not yet able to legally abolish the bedroom tax. That means tenants are still legally responsible for the rent due as a result of the reduction in their housing benefit. So it is important to send a very clear message to social tenants today. If you are affected by the bedroom tax, help is available, but you must apply for this help. You must engage with your landlord and apply for a DHP as soon as possible to enable you to pay the shortfall in your rent. And you should do so even if you've been refused a DHP in the past. Uh, presiding officer, let me be clear today. As a result of Scottish Government action, there will be no need for anyone to fall into rent arrears or face eviction as a result of the bedroom tax. <laughs> presiding officer, I hope this statement has been helpful in setting out the steps we now require to take to make good on our commitment to fully mitigate this iniquitous tax. I am proud that this Parliament has come together to protect those affected by the bedroom tax and I want to thank those in the Chamber, those on the Labour benches who have worked with us to achieve this. However, I will close with this reflection. There can surely be no better or stronger illustration of the need for this Parliament to have powers over welfare than the scandal of the bedroom tax. It simply, it simply cannot be right it is not right that a tax is imposed on Scotland against our will by a Westminster government we didn't vote for, forcing the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament to divert money from other devolved responsibility to mitigate its impact, and then to add insult to injury for us to have to jump through legal hoops to be able to spend the money we have set aside. That makes no sense whatsoever. What would make sense is for this parliament 
rather than having to mitigate the bedroom tax to instead have the power to ensure that we do not have a bedroom tax in the first place. Presiding officer, with full powers over welfare and taxation, this government and this parliament will be able to make the right decisions for the people of Scotland on these vitally important matters and that will be a much better position for all of us. <clears throat> the Deputy First Minister will now take questions on issues raised in her statement and tend to only 20 minutes for questions and then we must move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak button now. And can I tell members at the outset we are extremely tight for time all afternoon. So can you keep the questions as short as possible and the answers as short as possible too? In that way, I hope to allow everybody to get in. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for an advance copy of her statement? This day has indeed been a long time coming. In fact, it's been over a year since Scottish Labour called for the SNP to help people struggling with the bedroom tax. And the SNP have rejected our calls at every turn, preferring to use people's misery to boost their vote in the referendum instead of using the powers they have now. And be in no doubt they have those powers. We demonstrated that. But the SNP prefer to blame the Tories instead of looking at what they can do now to protect people. It took mass campaigns, petitions to the Parliament and a Members' Bill to force them to act. The SNP bowed to that pressure last September and announced an extra £20 million as a response to the Members' Bill. But it fell well short of what was required. And finally at the Budget in February, again in response to Labour's persistent calls, they finally agreed to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. But every step of the way, we have pushed and pulled the SNP along. The delay is theirs. And I want to know why it has taken more than a year for action to be taken by this Scottish Government. And whilst I welcome absolutely the transfer of power from the UK Government to the Scottish Government using a Section 63 order, we could have done this a lot quicker. We need to be swift in implementation so that the burden of the bedroom tax is lifted from everyone in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary agrees the bedroom tax is wrong. She agrees that it should be fully mitigated. Does she therefore agree, given the underspends in some local authority areas, to cancel out any bedroom tax debt for 2013-14? Well, it didn't take Jackie Bailey to uh, shatter any sense of consensus, uh, long to shatter any sense of consensus. Um, can I, I've already, I have already uh, in my statement made clear that I agree with Jackie Bailey about the importance of moving swiftly now to get these powers and to exercise these powers and I will undertake on behalf of the Scottish Government again to do everything in our power to do so. The fact of the matter here is that the Scottish Government all along has done everything within our powers and our resources to mitigate the bedroom tax. It is not easy for John Swinney to find millions of pounds to mitigate a policy imposed by a Westminster government. Uh, but last year we found £20 million and this year John Swinney has found £35 million. Interestingly, the Labour administration in Wales uh, last year found a grand total of £1.3 million and so far this year has contributed nothing, as far as I am aware, to mitigating the bedroom tax. So perhaps Labour should spend more time uh, directing its remarks to its own colleagues. But, you know, in continuing to attack the Scottish Government on the bedroom tax, Labour is aiming at the wrong target. The responsibility for the bedroom tax and the consequences of the bedroom tax lie with the UK Government. We are doing what we can to mitigate it, and that should be welcome. But mitigating a policy will never, ever be as good as having the power to abolish that policy. And that's why Labour's position, Labour's position on this, however sincere it might be, will always lack credibility for as long as they are content to leave the powers over welfare in the hands of a Tory government at Westminster. Alex Johnson. Can I take this opportunity, for no one else will, to pay tribute to the work of David Mundell MP, who has gone to such straight, great efforts to ensure that an alternative plan was put in place, should this government decide to, to, uh, to have decided to take it up?
his shuttle diplomacy around Scotland's local authorities, and now the solution, which has been placed in the hands of this government, which not only demonstrates the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the devolved settlement, but also solves the problem by devolving additional powers, something that this government has always been keen on. And while this government and the majority opposition party argue about the success of their various campaigns, can I just take this opportunity to ask one question that no one else has asked? What now for the tens of thousands of Scottish households assessed as overcrowded and languishing in need of rehousing on waiting lists? Will this government concentrate efforts and resources on, on delivering for these people instead of simply claiming victory while ignoring the problem that we were trying to address. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I look forward to meeting David Mundell tomorrow and I'm certainly grateful to him for doing what Ian Duncan Smith has failed to do over a three-month period, which is actually reply to the request of the Scottish Government. So let me give David Mundell credit for that. I'm not sure uh, to this day why it has taken uh, so long for the UK Government to decide that what they will do is pass a power to the Scottish Government to allow us to do the work to lift the cap. It would seem to me they could have agreed to do that very, very quickly indeed. Um, I welcome all additional powers. I welcome the transfer of the additional power to allow us to mitigate the bedroom tax and we will use that to the full. But the additional powers I want are the powers that will enable us to ensure that we don't have a bedroom tax in Scotland in the first place. Full powers over welfare so that we can stop the Tory government dismantling our welfare state and instead build one that actually fits the needs and values of people across this country. In terms of Alec Johnson's question about housing investment, this government is in investing significant sums of money in affordable housing. We are also in the teeth of opposition from Alec Johnson and his own colleagues abolishing the right to buy so we can safeguard social housing for the needs of those who rely upon it. We will continue to do that, but we will never ever be part of an attempt uh, that is uh, clearly been made by a Tory government to penalise people for uh, what they obviously consider to be the crime of being poor. We are on the side of people who are struggling to get out of poverty, and that's the difference between this government and the Tory government at Westminster. Kevin Stewart, followed by Willie Rennie. million pounds of the 50 million pounds required to mitigate the bedroom tax. Uh, does the Deputy First Minister share my concerns that the UK government may choose to withdraw that funding at any time? Deputy First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do think that is a real concern and that is uh, something that we will continue to engage uh, very closely with the UK government on. It is important that they, uh, until such times as this parliament has full powers over welfare, which I hope will be sooner rather than later, that they continue uh, to provide that support. Um, I you know, go back to the original point I made, though. I, I think it is not the best way of governing any country uh, for policies, wrong-headed policies, to be imposed for money then to have to be taken from other uh, purposes to mitigate the impact of those policies. Far better that we have the ability in this parliament to decide the kind of welfare policies we want to fund them properly uh, rather than have this ridiculous situation where we're in the position of having to pick up the pieces of the mess made by Westminster. Will there any followed by Annabel Ewing? Uh, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for an advanced copy of her statement? She'll know that I've taken a close interest in this matter for some time. First, to increase the DHP funds provided by the UK Government, and second of all, to lift the cap. John Swinney and I have been in regular dialogue about this matter, and I'm pleased that the change has now been delivered, or is about to be delivered. I've spoken to the Secretary of State for Scotland in the last few days, who's told me that this order that she describes in her statement will be processed with the necessary speed so we can get on with this. So can I tell the Deputy First Minister that I'll continue to provide a constructive support in this matter? Deputy First Minister. Can I thank Willie Rennie? Can I uh, take the opportunity to, to thank Willie Rennie for his contribution on this issue? I know he has tried to be helpful in uh, getting us to the position that we are now in. I certainly uh, welcome the comments that he reports from the Secretary of State about the uh, commitment to a swift process, and I'll be looking uh, to pin down those commitments uh, from David Mundell when I meet him uh, tomorrow. And I, I welcome uh, Willie Rennie's uh, 
offer to continue to be constructive. I regret the fact that we have a Tory Liberal uh, government at Westminster that is imposing this policy, necessitating our uh, efforts to mitigate it. But nevertheless, I take uh, Willie Rennie's uh, contribution in good faith and will continue to ensure uh, that we work together across this Parliament uh, to do what we think is right, and that is to take away the impact of this inequitous policy. Annabel Ewing, followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And on the basis that the Scottish Government's mitigation of the bedroom tax means that funds have to be diverted from other Scottish budgets to pay for Westminster mistakes, does the Deputy First Minister not think, therefore, that it is simply misleading and indeed absurd for the UK Government to claim that an independent Scotland could not meet the social protection needs of her people? First Minister. Well, I, I think that is uh, not only ridiculous, it is completely and utterly false. The fact of the matter is that uh, social protection payments uh, are more affordable in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. They take up a smaller proportion of our tax revenues and of our GDP, our economy as a whole. Uh, so we can more than afford to support a decent welfare system of our own. What we lack in Scotland and in this Parliament right now is the power to determine what that system looks like. And I think the time has long passed when we should be prepared to watch Westminster governments dismantle the welfare state and instead take the powers to allow us to build one that is fit for purpose, one that this Parliament and this country can be proud of. Ian Gray, followed by Christina McKelvey. The Deputy First Minister said in her statement that no one need fall into rent arrears or face eviction due to the bedroom tax, uh, and that is very, very welcome. But the point, uh, which I think we share, is to ensure that no one affected need pay it at all. So can she categorically confirm that any tenant affected by the bedroom tax who applies for DHP support will automatically get it? And what plans does she have to proactively make sure that such tenants do apply? First well, let me uh, answer that question in a, a twofold way. Firstly, Ian Gray will know, and he knows as well as I do, that local authorities administer uh, discretionary housing payments. So they require to receive, to assess, and to adjudicate on uh, the applications. But let me make absolutely unequivocally clear that the money the Scottish Government is making available to local authorities in this year, in our budget, is for the purpose of ensuring that no tenant is affected by the bedroom tax. And we will expect uh, local authorities to operate their DHPs and the money that we have made available in a way that delivers uh, that objective. And if Ian Gray or any other member uh, has concerns that that is not happening, then they will, I'm sure, uh, feel able and free to bring that to uh, my uh, attention. Um, in terms of the second part of Ian Gray's question, I made very clear in my, my statement, and I I'm grateful to him for giving me the chance to reiterate this point because if I have a concern about this, it is people reading the newspapers and watching the television and hearing this statement think that they no longer have to think about the bedroom tax. We are not able to abolish the bedroom tax. So the legal responsibility to pay the shortfall in housing benefit lies with the tenant. The help is available as a result of the money we are making available, but tenants must apply for that. I would hope all MSPs will help through their own constituency networks to communicate that message. I know that local authorities and housing associations will uh, take the time and effort to communicate that message to their tenants, and the Scottish Government will do everything we can to make sure that message fully gets across. Christina McKelvey, followed by Michael McMahon. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I welcome this eventual decision now to allow the Scottish Government to lift the cap. This will be very reassuring to the people I know that suffer from motor neuron disease and live in adapted homes, who were told by Lord Freud to take in a lodger or to work longer hours or risk losing their homes, if some, as some have already have. But surely, surely full control of welfare is the only way to protect these vulnerable people. First Minister. Uh, well, Casina McKelvey raises um, an important point because, as members are aware, a significant proportion of the households affected by the bedroom tax contained at least one person with a disability, which was one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the many reasons that made this, makes this tax so deeply unfair, wrong and iniquitous. Um, I believe that uh, we need to do what we can to mitigate it. That's why I've set out the action that we're taking. But Christina McKelvey is correct. Uh, and it goes back to the point Ian Gray has just raised with me. Uh, we are not able to abolish the bedroom tax. I want us to be in a position where we're not uh, asking tenants to apply for help to enable them to mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax. I want us to be in a position where we can abolish the bedroom tax. And we've made clear uh, as a government that if we get those powers, then we will 
will immediately exercise them to make sure the bedroom tax is once and for all a thing of the past. Michael McMahon, followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary has quite rightly raised concerns about the timescale of the introduction of the Section 63 order. I think um, that the last time this was used in the Parliament was through the Rural Affairs Committee in 2008. And on that timescale, it could be that we would look at have this in front of Parliament at the earliest November or December of this year. Can the, the, the Cabinet Secretary confirm that that's the case? And also, in the meantime, the Cabinet Secretary says this is the only way in which monies can be got to those who are being affected. But some local authorities have raised with the Welfare Reform Committee that they have ideas and schemes for uh, providing support at this time. Uh, the Audit Scotland have approved those uh, methods. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure us that no local authority that has a mechanism for, for getting assistance to people uh, will be prevented from doing so in order to force them to, to pursue the Scottish Government's preferred method of DHP? Cabinet I, I can understand uh, and uh, I should say share some of the concerns Michael McMahon has just articulated about timescale, which is why I made uh, put such an emphasis on that in my statement. Uh, I'll come back to that point briefly in a second, but let me be very clear. Assuming we can, and this is our clear intention, get the power transferred and then be able to exercise that power uh, timorously uh, in order to get the full £50 million, pounds, the £35 million of that coming uh, from the Scottish Government to local authorities, there will be no requirement for local authorities to look at alternative schemes, any alternative scheme. And I've looked very closely, as I'm sure Michael McMahon has, at the examples that he's talking about. No alternative scheme works as well or as directly as getting money to tenants through discretionary housing payments. So our intention and our objective is to ensure that that is the route that we use to channel all of the available funding. Uh, in terms of the precedent uh, Michael McMahon has raised, I'm, obviously I'm aware of the precedent in, uh, precedents in terms of use of Section 63 orders. Um, I said in my statement, and I'll repeat again, I will update MSPs as soon as I can following discussions with David Mundell about what I can consider to be the likely timescales for this process and every stage of the process. It has to be done as quickly as possible, and I would certainly hope uh, that we will be in a position of having uh, an order before Parliament earlier than the timescale that he uh, indicated there based on precedence. But I'll be in a better position uh, to advise MSPs of the position once I've had the discussions I've referred to. And I certainly take heart from uh, the reported comments from the Secretary of State from Willie Rennie, uh, which suggests a willingness on the part of the UK Government to move as quickly as possible. There will certainly be a willingness on the part of the Scottish Government uh, to move quickly. Uh, this needn't uh, be overly complicated. Let's get the power transferred, and then when we've got it transferred, we can move quickly to exercise it. Stuart McMillan, followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I do welcome the announcement. However, does the Deputy First Minister consider that this new power will actually assist some people who have been left with no choice but to, to use food banks to feed, to feed themselves and their families? And if not, what support is the Scottish Government able to provide? Deputy First Minister. Um, Obviously, taking away the impact of the bedroom tax is going to help uh, a lot of people. And, you know, I indicated earlier on there are more than 70,000 families affected by the bedroom tax, so they are uh, the people who, who will be helped by the action that I've outlined today. But I think it is an important point to make that the bedroom tax is but one aspect of the welfare cuts and changes currently being implemented by the Westminster Government. We're seeing many other changes that are having a big impact on people. Cumulatively, it is estimated that these changes will drive an additional, up to an additional 100,000 children into poverty by 2020. Uh, and it's the changes as a whole that are driving the explosion in the demand for food banks. Um, I think it is a scandal in a country as rich as Scotland that we have so many people reliant on food banks. Um, we are, as a government, as the member will be aware, seeking to help uh, with the provision uh, of food banks uh, as much as possible. I recently made some uh, announcement of additional funding to do that, and we will continue to do uh, just that. But, you know, we must get ourselves into a position where we, can't, we do not have to sit passively by while policies are implemented that consign so many more of our children to reliance on food banks and to poverty, and we will only get into that position when we have responsibility for designing our own welfare system. Patrick Harvey, followed by Ken McIntosh. Thank you. Both government and opposition should be proud of the work they've done in defeating the bedroom tax in the social rented sector. But the Deputy First Minister will be aware it was introduced first in the private rented sector. Does she agree that with social rent unavailable for many people, owner occupation unaffordable for many people, 
the private rented sector is not just a free market choice, and we should have a long-term ambition to reverse the introduction of the bedroom tax in the private rented sector as well in an independent Scotland. Deputy First well, I've got a great deal of sympathy with the view that Patrick Harvey has expressed, but I'm sure he will understand why, within the powers and resources we've got right now, we are right to focus, and I know he does agree, we're right to focus on uh, the bedroom tax in the social rented sector. He will be aware of uh, the commitment of the government to improve the provision and the quality of accommodation in the private rented sector, and, but nevertheless, his, the long-term ambition that he has asked me to share there, I certainly have a lot of sympathy with. In the meantime, of course, we have to continue to do as much as we can to ensure that there is good quality provision of social rented accommodation in order that we don't have a situation where people, as Patrick Harvey has described, it can't afford to own property um, and don't want to be in the private rented sector. And we'll continue to be very focused on doing a range of things uh, to achieve that ambition. Finally, Ken McIntosh. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the wide disparity in the awarding of DHPs, uh, with an average award of £710 in Aberdeen compared to that of £140 in South Ayrshire, and with, I think, 45 application refusals in Stirling compared to 7,500 application refusals in Glasgow. Can I ask what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure the money it's responsible for distributing through DHPs is awarded equitably and fairly? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'll repeat something I said to Ian Gray, which is just a statement of fact. It is the responsibility of local authorities to administer DHPs. We don't have the power to direct exactly how they do that, but we have made very clear uh, that the whole purpose of making this money available, the whole purpose of getting the power to increase the cap, is to enable enough money uh, to be available in DHPs to fully mitigate the bedroom tax. And the decisions uh, that are being made on DHP applications have to reflect that. I think the average award overall for uh, DHPs in uh, the last financial year was £357. Uh, pounds. There was more than 70,000 uh, awards made uh, in total. Uh, so, you know, we have uh, gone to great lengths uh, in order to make this money available and to get the power we need to spend it. To be fair to local authorities, uh, they... Uh, in the main, uh, dislike the bedroom tax and its impact as much as the Scottish Government and this, uh, the opposition uh, dislike the bedroom tax. And I know they will want to work with us to make sure that what I have announced today has the effect that all of us want it to have. Thank you. My apologies to Sandra White and to Alex Rowley that I wasn't able to call them. We need to move on to next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 9927. In the name of Alison Johnson, Energy and Climate Change, members who wish to take part in this debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Alison Johnson to speak to move the motion. Ms Johnson, you have no more than 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you, presiding officer. It's generally agreed that our energy policy should deliver three things. A secure supply at an affordable cost and energy which is low in climate changing carbon emissions. In the face of relentless price hikes by the big six energy companies who dominate the UK market, affordability is really important, particularly here in Scotland with our northern climate, higher energy prices and rural homes. Take into account the impact of price falls in the United States and the fact that gas produces fewer emissions than coal when burnt, it's perhaps not surprising that there are advocates for the exploration and extraction of unconventional gas. Indeed, the Prime Minister has asserted that unconventional gas has real potential to drive down energy prices and assures us that the benefits are clear. But the belief that unconventional gas will push prices down is a false hope. Lord Brown, chairperson of fracking company Cordrilla and key UK government adviser, understands this reality. George Osborne, Chancellor of the Exchequer, has been forced to understand the same, telling the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee he did not want to overpromise on gas prices. And the same committee also heard from industry and academics such as Bloomberg, EDF, E.ON and the UK Energy Research Centre that the impact on household bills is very likely to be insignificant. So I think we can put to bed the argument that unconventional gas is going to make bills cheaper. Extracting gas onshore in the UK will be much more challenging compared with the US and in any case, prices will still be set by the integrated European gas market. DART, for example, will sell to SSE at market rates. So Lord Stern was right when he dismissed the Prime Minister's claims of cheaper energy from shale as baseless economics. 
Presiding officer, it is my view, that of my party and many, many others, that unconventional gas extraction is not a solution to our energy and climate challenges, but a symptom of a much wider problem. Having exhausted the easier to extract energy sources, we're resorting to more extreme methods of energy extraction. We're digging and drilling deeper in some of the world's most stunning, pristine and remote locations and who knows, possibly soon in a field near your home. But we know that energy companies already hold far more fossil fuel reserves than it is safe to burn. The unburnable carbon 2013 report calculates that between 60 to 80% of coal, oil and gas reserves of publicly listed companies are unburnable if the world is to have a chance of not exceeding global warming of two degrees. The IPCC and the International Energy Agency have calculated the amount of carbon emissions we can safely put into the atmosphere and conclude that the only way to avoid dangerous climate change is to leave a large proportion of our known oil, coal and gas in the ground. Some 30 or so miles away from this chamber, DART Energy has submitted planning applications for the UK's first unconventional gas development to involve production rather than solely exploration. Experts at the Tyndall Centre in Manchester describe the government's approach to unconventional gas as a bellwether of its commitment to leadership on climate change. Senior analysts at French Bank, French Bank Société Générale say they are looking to what happens in the UK as the forefront of the industry in Europe. DART Energy's development is the most advanced unconventional gas project in the UK. But here in Scotland, we have the opportunity to act on the commitments and promises of leadership on climate change by simply saying no to a whole new set of fossil fuel problems and to rule unconventional gas out of bounds in Scotland. Communities around Earth, Falkirk and Stirling have had long-standing concerns about their health and the health of the local environment should more coal-bed methane wells go ahead. They were absolutely astonished to find out that test drilling had been happening without their knowledge. Indeed, even the council leader claimed he was unaware of this. Campaigners in Canonby near Dumfries continue to fight the threat to their area from the second most advanced project in Scotland. This project revealed a loophole where permission for coal bed methane could be converted to permission for fracking without proper scrutiny. A vast area of the central belt can be licensed for unconventional gas. And oil barons from the US are highlighting a process called underground coal gasification, which involves burning coal seams under the Firth of Forth and off Fife. I don't want energy projects that threaten the health of communities and local environments. We don't need them. We're at the tipping point of producing most of our, most of our, the majority of our electricity from renewable sources. Analysis from, for example, energy consultants Garad Hassan and Friends of the Earth Scotland's Power of Scotland report show that even with a growing demand on electricity, as heating switches from gas to electricity, we can power Scotland with a mix of renewables, pumped storage and smart grid. And that's before we even get better at investing in energy efficiency models. There's also public support for renewables, a whopping 80% according to the most recent DEC commissioned poll. Contrast that with the growing opposition to fracking. YouGov polling released yesterday revealed Scotland to be the UK nation most opposed to fracking. 80% of people opposed UK government plans to allow underground drilling without landowner permission. Presiding officer, we really don't know how much gas is available, but we do know that production time will be measured in years and decades, not hundreds of years. What we do know for sure is that unconventional gas will require a multi-million pound investment and production won't peak for another decade, probably more, just as we're planning to decarbonise. We all know, unfortunately, that we've missed the first two of our climate targets. And even though the emissions trend is going in the right direction, it's vital that we bolster the credibility of our world-leading legislation. 
The third target will be reported on soon. WWF's energy report concluded that by 2050, all of the world's energy could be provided cleanly, renewably and affordably. And the report looked at barriers to, tra to transition. And one of the biggest is that globally, more money is being invested in dirty fossil fuels than in clean renewables. WWF say in their briefing for today's debate that having rightly attracted the attention of the world for its ambitious Climate Change Act and its commitment to climate justice, it's critical that the Scottish Government and Parliament now fulfil the promises under the Act and reap the benefits presented by the low carbon transition. They go on to say that our commitments to meet these obligations, our international reputation for climate change, our policy to decarbonise the energy system and our 100% renewables target will seriously lack credibility if Scotland were to go down the route of facilitating or encouraging an alternative fossil fuel. With WWF, with Friends of the Earth Scotland, I urge the government to say no to unconventional gas extraction in Scotland. A ban on unconventional gas in Scotland would focus our efforts on truly renewable sources rather than scraping the bottom of the fossil fuels barrel. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on John Swinney to speak to and move amendment 9927.3, Cabinet Secretary, maximum seven minutes, please. Uh, President Officer, I welcome the debate that has been initiated by the Green Party today on energy and climate change, and it provides an opportunity to consider the range of measures that the Scottish Government is taking to develop the very strong opportunity we have in Scotland to produce energy. We are a country blessed with an abundance of natural resources. Our conventional oil and gas sector continues to be a tremendous asset to the Scottish economy. The sector employs over 200,000 people in Scotland, and since the 1970s, when resources were first recovered, it has provided over £300 billion in taxation revenues to Westminster. The future of the sector continues to look promising, with Oil and Gas UK predicting a further 24 billion barrels of oil that are still recoverable. This figure translates into a potential wholesale value of £1.5 trillion if managed properly, which has a tremendous potential to transform local communities across Scotland. The oil and gas sector also represents a significant export and internationalisation opportunity for Scotland. And at uh, the present moment, the uh, Energy Minister Fergus Ewing is in the United States at the OTC event, which essentially uh, brings together um, many organisations involved in oil and gas with a significant presence of Scottish companies that are trading around the world as a major part of our global industry, of course. Ian Gray. Mr Swinney knows that I agree with him on the importance of the oil and gas sector, but I wonder if he can enlighten us as to when he intends to bring forward his uh, revised estimates for revenue from that sector. Cabinet Secretary. I, I told Parliament I would bring those forward in the coming weeks, and that's exactly what uh, I intend to do uh, to assist in the debate. Now, while we recognise the importance of a vibrant industry in the North Sea, the Scottish Government is actively working towards the transition to a low-carbon economy. In this respect, I agree entirely with the, um, the, 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 the general thrust of Alison Johnson's speech about the importance of ensuring that we develop the opportunities that exist to secure the gains and the opportunities of a low-carbon economy. And the government has worked tirelessly within a stable policy framework to promote and to develop a renewables industry in Scotland, a strategy that is now bearing considerable fruit. By any measure, Scotland's renewable energy sector is going from strength to strength. We know that we have an estimated 25% of Europe's offshore wind potential, 25% of Europe's tidal energy potential, and 10% of Europe's capacity for wave power. So we are determined as a government to ensure that we capture that opportunity and we have set a framework to achieve that by establishing stretching targets to meet at least 30% of Scotland's overall energy demand from renewable sources by 2020, including the target to meet the equivalent of 100% of gross annual electricity demand from renewables by 2020, with an interim, interim target of 50% by 2015. So by any measure, the government has put in place a clear, robust, consistent policy framework that enables us to achieve those objectives. We now generate almost... Uh, yes? 
Claudia Beamish. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that. Um, in view of uh, recent, recent uh, announcements by electricity companies uh, about the, the offshore um, the sector for renewables, um, does the Cabinet Secretary share with me any concerns about um, how this very important future uh, can be driven forward in, in um, achieving a low carbon economy? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I certainly don't think that the um, uncertainty that's been created by the electricity market reform process undertaken by the United Kingdom government has helped investors to make their decisions about the offshore sector. I certainly don't think that's helped. Um, but we now have some clarity in that respect. And obviously the Scottish government is heavily engaged to ensure that we secure these opportunities. Now, members will ask why is the transition to the low carbon economy important? Well, it's absolutely vital because it is central to our efforts to tackle climate change. Uh, Scotland's climate change legislation commits us to world-leading targets of at least 42 per cent cuts in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020 and 80 per cent by 2050. Um, we are more than halfway to meeting our 2020 target of a 42 per cent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and the Committee on Climate Change recently reported that good progress has been made in Scotland in reducing emissions across the economy, and more specifically in energy. This is very good news, but we do recognise that we have to do more. Tougher decisions and major transformational changes still lie ahead and everybody will need to be on board for Scotland's transition to a low carbon society to enable us to achieve these objectives. Can I now turn, Presiding Officer, to the issues in relation to unconventional gas? Um, to date, we have strongly endorsed the robust regulation of any techniques associated with unconventional oil and gas and we are pleased that our environmental regulator, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, published guidance on shale gas and coal bed methane in December 2012. The Scottish Government has consistently worked with the principal regulators to ensure that an appropriate and robust regulatory framework is in, in place. This is essential to protect our communities and environment, both now and for the future. Um, Yes. Alison Johnston. Thank you. Um, while it may be possible to prove that extraction is safe, it simply won't be possible to prove that burning the fuel extracted is safe. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there are more fossil fuels that we can, than we can burn? Cabinet Secretary, you are approaching your last minute. I, I appreciate that. Sir. The key point I would say to Alison Johnson is that all of this has to be considered within our framework to reduce climate change targets. I've just finished a uh, commentary in my, in my speech about the importance of realising our climate change targets. Uh, so any action that is taken in relation to the development of energy resources must in the first hand be compatible with the robust regulatory framework that we've put in place in terms of the regulation of all of these areas and secondly must also enable us to secure the necessary progress that is required on our climate change targets into the bargain. Um, the Government uh, continues to keep the regulatory framework under review. Um, for example, we have recognised there are a significant amount of uh, scientific evidence available on unconventionals, and to ensure that this information is assessed effectively, the Scottish Government has convened an independent expert scientific panel to review that evidence, and of course that will be instrumental in informing any further decisions that the Government takes, which of course will have a bearing on Scottish planning policy, which is currently under review and which will be the subject of uh, conclusions by the Planning Minister in due course, along with the National Planning Framework, which has attracted interest from uh, parliamentary committees. Uh, the Government has in place robust arrangements to ensure that these issues are dealt with um, effectively and satisfactorily, and that also we fulfil our obligations, which this Parliament passed, to ensure that we have world-leading uh, legislation on climate change reduction and that, uh, on, on climate ch emissions reduction under the climate change legislation, and that, more importantly, we fulfil that legislation. Thank you very much. I should advise the Chamber there is no extra time available this afternoon, so interventions should be contained within speeches. I call on Ian Gray to speak to and move Amendment 9927.15 minutes. Mr Gray. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I want to start, too, by congratulating Alison Johnson for bringing this debate forward, because it is an important and current policy issue, which I think, until now, we have largely debated uh, only in committee. However, while we welcome the Greens' debate, uh, we cannot support their motion. Firstly, uh, it conflates coal bed methane extraction and hydraulic fracturing, not the same thing. It calls these new methods of extraction, and they are not. Uh, they both have a long history, and fracking is common uh, offshore day by day. Secondly, well, surely. Alison Johnston. Aware that uh, in the areas where unconventional gas 
extraction occurs, 40% of coal bed, for, coal bed methane um, extraction in 40% of cases leads to hydraulic fracturing. Ingrid. But indeed, they are two different processes, as Ms Johnson herself pointed out when she complained about the fact that one can move easily to the other in terms of the, the regulatory framework. Secondly, while the UK government rates incentive in England does seem to me a rather blunt instrument, we should be careful not to dismiss the idea of community benefit where onshore extraction ever to proceed. After all, we accept the idea that there should be community benefit from onshore wind and open cast coal mining, uh, so perhaps we shouldn't dismiss it out of hand uh, in this case. Primarily, though, we cannot support the motion's core proposal of an outright ban. Of course, we do, as the Green motion says, have to meet our targets under the Climate Change Act, and our own amendment makes that clear. But we have to take the public with us, and that means being able to demonstrate how we will secure our energy supply as we transition to a balanced but decarbonised energy economy. In a recent briefing in the Parliament, Professor uh, Lunn uh, from Strathclyde University demonstrated that even if all of the renewables targets Mr Swinney referred to are met by 2020, then there will still be a 13 gigawatt hour gap uh, in energy production. Central to those figures is the loss of baseload generation and the fact that 40% of energy consumption is currently gas-fired heating. Gackenzie is closed. Peterhead, two-thirds mothballed. Longanet, perhaps at the mercy of new EU directives. The replacement of Torness and Hunterson is currently vetoed by ministers. Commercial carbon capture seems further away than we had hoped, and it is not clear where our future baseload is coming from. Meanwhile, uh, investment in offshore wind projects is at best delayed, for whatever reason, uh, and we have seen significant withdrawals from marine power projects too. We urgently need a hard-headed, realistic, comprehensive plan for how we transition to a decarbonised energy market while still protecting security of energy supplies, including, but not only, energy, uh, electricity generation. And having closed down the, to my mind, eminently sensible option of another generation of no-carbon nuclear power, we are in no position to shut down another potential energy source especially when we do not even yet have the scientific evidence for what reserves there are available. We should, though, in our view, proceed with great caution, hence our consistent support for stronger planning guidelines for shale gas extraction. Nor should we allow ourselves to be taken in by the idea that shale gas is a panacea which will cut energy costs. Uh, Alison Johnson's motion is absolutely right about that. And that is one reason why we cannot support the Tory motion this afternoon. Cutting energy bills needs reform of the market and action on excessive profits <coughs> by the big six uh, companies. Final minute. Nor should we forget that shale gas is an industrial feedstock as well as an energy source. And it's not so long since the whole of this parliament supported a deal which kept the Ineos plant in Grangemouth open a deal which is exactly about using shale gas as raw material in a manufacturing enterprise of economic significance to this country, a fact uh, which was made very clear to us when we saw the impact that temporary closure had had uh, on GDP figures uh, for the relevant quarter. As for the government's motion, uh, well, it founds on planning policy we have not yet seen, uh, and uh, in our view, it refuses to face up to the fact that they continue to miss uh, all of those world-beating climate change targets. However, with regard to the crux of this debate, how to proceed, our position is very similar to the government. So if by some curious and unexpected twist of parliamentary arithmetic, their amendment survives and our fall, ours falls, we will support it in the final vote. However, we do prefer our own amendment and will prefer it in the first instance tonight and I therefore move that amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And to now call on Marjorie Fraser to speak to move amendment 9927.2, maximum five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Scottish Greens for giving us the opportunity this afternoon to debate the extraction of unconventional gas throughout Scotland. And I, can I commend uh, Alan Johnson uh, on at least being consistent on this issue, although in my view, uh, consistently wrong. 
Uh, and like Ian Gray, I fear she has misrepresented key aspects of the debate. Firstly, the Green Motion refers to significant public opposition to new methods of fossil fuel extraction, such as fracking and coal bed methane. Now, certainly there are those in the environmental movement who have been doing their best to whip up such opposition, going around the country peddling their pseudoscience and their hysterical scare stories about earthquakes, exploding taps, and all the rest. But when we actually, no, thank you. When we actually look at public opinion, we see no one, not everyone at least, is buying this nonsense. According to the latest DEC public opinion tracker published just last week, more people support shale gas extraction than oppose it, and the numbers are growing. And we should remember, no, I need to make some progress. We, need, we should remember there's nothing new about fracking for shale gas and extracting coal seam gas in Scotland. Back in the 1960s in Lanarkshire, and as recently as the 1980s, within the boundaries of the city of Glasgow, fracking has taken place. And as Ian Gray said, fracking takes place at the moment in the North Sea with none of the apocalyptic side effects that some in the environmental movement have predicted. Now, beside the officer, I believe there are four key advantages to exploiting our conventional, unconventional gas reserves. The first of these is in relation to security of supply. We have gone from being a nation which is a net exporter of gas to being an importer as we develop more and more renewable sources of energy, particularly those like wind, which have an intermittent output, our reliance on gas will actually increase over the medium term. So the question is not whether or not we will require gas, because it is beyond doubt we will be increasingly reliant upon it over the coming decades. The question is, where will that gas come from? Will it be produced domestically, or will it be important? I certainly do not want to see us in future decades reliant on Mr Putin's Russia for our gas supplies. And for that reason alone, it makes sense to, to develop a domestic source of gas to provide for our energy needs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's the question of impact on energy bills. Now, it's well known that in the US, the development of a shale gas industry has dramatically cut energy costs and led to a reindustrialization of the US economy as a result. I do not think anyone reasonably predicts a similar impact here in the UK but increasing the domestic supply of gas is bound to have a beneficial impact on energy prices uh, as we increase the supply. Thirdly, there's the issue of carbon emissions. The US has saved millions of tonnes of carbon by shifting away from burning coal towards burning gas. Now, gas is certainly a fossil fuel, but cleaner than coal. And as we develop, low carbon alternatives must be a better option, at least in the medium term. And fourthly, there is the economic opportunity that is presented. There is a potential for tens of thousands of jobs to be created in a new industry of real benefit to Scotland and one that is complementary to the development of more renewables. Ian Gray reminded us that last year there was a consensus across all Scottish political parties that the Ineos plant in Grangemouth should be saved. I am delighted that it was with the Scottish and UK governments working together as hundreds of jobs being safeguarded in central Scotland. The Ineos plant depends upon shale gas as its raw material, shipping that gas in a fleet of Chinese-built tankers across the Atlantic from Pennsylvania. <coughs> now, it's not surprising that Ineos themselves are keen to see a domestic supply of shale gas as a feeder product. And on every level, that must make sense. Presiding officer, I don't recall the Green Party in the course of the last year distancing themselves from that political consensus around the Ineos plant Final and minute. calling for it to be shut down. But if they have, have any consistency of opinion, that is what they should be doing. For by opposing unconventional gas, they are opposing those many jobs in the Falkirk area. Presiding officer, I believe that unconventional gas presents a tremendous opportunity for Scotland, always provided that the appropriate environmental safeguards are put in place. And I look forward to seeing uh, the Scottish Government's proposals following its expert review panel. I do struggle to understand the lack of enthusiasm from the Scottish Government, a government that falls over itself to promote the offshore oil and gas industry, but when it comes to the same industry onshore, seems strangely reluctant to be supportive. But like Ian Gray, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for the Government amendment, and should our own amendment fall, I would be prepared to support it. The UK Government has brought forward incentives for the exploitation of unconventional gas, and it is right to do so, recognising the opportunities presented. I hope the Scottish Government will follow suit and see this as a new industry which can be of great benefit to Scotland for future generations. And I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. We turn to the open debate. We are very tight for time. Speeches of a maximum of four minutes. Rob Gibson to be followed by Margaret McDougall.
Thank you, President Officer. Scotland has a rich diversity of energy sources, including a very successful oil and gas sector and growing expertise in renewables, including wind, wave and tidal, as it says in the SNP amendment. The background to SNP thinking goes back decades to the early days of oil and gas extraction in the 1970s and 80s. We viewed the North Sea oil wealth as a source of investment in the industries of the future, including energy conservation and alternative energy, as the late Stephen Maxwell reminded us in his book, Arguing for Independence, which was published in 2012. Stephen went on to point out how Scotland and Norway are similarly blessed or cursed, depending on your outlook. Both have huge hydrocarbon deposits and both have huge renewable potential. The SNP, from the early days of North Sea oil extraction, talked about slower extraction and legacy potential. The Norwegians practised it, while we could only look on with envy during the long Thatcher years and Blair's continuation of that extractive mentality. All that time, uh, Norway insisted on a big stake for Statoil to balance what was called the greed of the Seven Sisters of Big Oil. Norway also insisted on a slower rate of extraction with tighter environmental and safety laws. The recent helicopter accident rate contrasts sharply between the UK and Norwegian sectors, as an example. The SNP in those pre-devolution days was thinking what independence could bring for energy policy when the Green Party was only being formed. Fast forward to Scotland today, and agreement between our two parties that independence is essential is a given. It is increasingly possible to decarbonise our energy needs and to manage our wealth for a fairer Scandinavian style of social democracy that is light years from the UK attitude of successive governments. Beside an officer, Jason Anderson, head of the EU Climate and Energy Policy uh, Group at WWF Europe, hailed Scotland as a forward-thinking nation in the vanguard of the renewable revolution and with the most ambitious climate change laws. The SNP proposes a list of green gains from independence, as Richard Lockhead set out last week. So this debate today on a wish to decarbonise our energy sources should have that trajectory in full focus. The Green Party should not ignore that hydrocarbon development has given us a huge skills base in Aberdeen's worldwide success story. It's up to us to channel that expertise onto the full range of renewable development in the service of not only Scotland, but through interconnectors to our neighbours for electricity across Europe and in the service of the planet to tackle the scourge of climate change. We Just can enshrine environmental protection in a written constitution. We can turn our leading renewables production record of near 50% electricity output to reach 100% by 2020, with unswerving focus on the delivery of on and offshore clean power, through the certain knowledge that a Scottish Government in charge of all of our policies will ensure business investment has security. Under the UK Government, they have had an extractive mentality from the 1970s to this day, Recall the dash for gas, their nuclear obsession, and total lack of legacy planning to turn one-off oil wealth into the fund for future generations that our people need. Recently, a poll uh, for, uh, must come to a close, for DEC uh, showed that 50% uh, of Tories preferred wind farms to fracking in their backyard. Many more people across Scotland want the same. Yeah. Thank you very much, Margaret McDougall, to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As stated in Labour's amendment today, Scotland needs a robust and balanced energy policy that strives to meet our energy needs with our climate change and carbon reduction targets. I do not agree with the Greens' motion today that unconventional gas extraction should be banned outright, nor do I agree with the approach taken by the Westminster Government, who seemed to have embraced shale gas with open arms and at times flaunted proper regulation in the rush to do so. Currently, the scale of impact on health, on the climate and the local environment of fracking is as yet unknown and it would be foolhardy to welcome the industry until we better understand the implications. 
With that in mind, our approach to fracking should be cautious and based on scientific evidence. It's an industry that could be damaging to our climate change targets, so I'm calling on the Scottish Government today to bring forward robust national guidelines, including planning, for all forms of unconventional gas extraction before the industry is allowed to continue in Scotland. I see no reason to rush into fracking because expansion of the shale gas industry is unlikely to assist us in our attempts to meet carbon reduction targets, create jobs or bring down energy costs to assist the estimated 900,000 people who currently suffer from fuel poverty. It could be argued shale gas extraction has driven down the cost of energy within the US, but the same is unlikely to occur here. According to a report carried out by the US Energy Information Administration, compared with North America, the shale geology of the UK is considerably more complex, while drilling and completion costs for shale wells are substantially higher. Friends of the Earth also point to the fact that industry is unlikely to create significant jobs growth within Scotland, with Dart Energy's Earth project only likely to create 20 jobs. While fracking might well increase our energy security, I would argue a better way to do this would be through promotion of a diverse energy supply, including a strong renewable sector with a drive towards community ownership. This would also help meet our climate change and carbon reduction targets. However, the renewable sector in Scotland could be at threat from separation Scotland currently receives around a third of all renewable subsidies in the UK, despite representing only 10% of the consumer base. If we were to separate, this cost would fall to Scottish consumers, invariably putting energy costs up, forcing even more people into fuel poverty. Final minute. So, finally, in terms of community ownership, Scottish Labour has always advocated community ownership as a vehicle for empowering local communities, tackling social justice and delivering economic growth. Community ownership in renewables would not only help Scotland meet renewable targets, but also create green jobs while tackling fuel poverty. In conclusion, presiding officer, there is no reason to rush into fracking in Scotland. At this stage, it would seem to provide very limited gain for what could be a disaster for the environment, to our health, and to our climate change targets. Fracking should be halted until robust national guidelines, including planning, are in place to make sure it is in line with our Scottish energy policy. Instead, we should be looking to secure an affordable, diverse energy supply that, above all, tackles the scourge of fuel poverty. Thank you. Many thanks. I call Mike McKenzie to be followed by Marco Biaggi. Presiding officer, I welcome the Scottish Government's precautionary approach to hydraulic fracturing and unconventional gas extraction, and I therefore have some sympathy with Alison Johnson's motion, but only some. I'm proud of Scotland's world-leading climate change legislation because it strikes a sensible balance between the need to reduce our CO2 emissions and the need to maintain our economy. And this requires a long-term approach, and I'm pleased that we're on course to meet our long-term targets. Unfortunately, the Green Party focus too much on short-term figures, denying the reality of economic difficulties which may face us in any given year, denying the effect that poor economic performance would have on the poorest people in our society, denying the effects on jobs and unemployment and the increase in poverty that Green Party policies would bring. No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm short of time. I was disappointed, for instance, in a recent debate to hear Patrick Harvey dismiss the opportunity presented by carbon capture and storage, an opportunity that offers possibilities of not just decarbonising our own energy supply, but helping to do so for member, uh, many of our neighbouring sources. No, I'm not taking interventions. I'm, I'm short of time. Sorry, another occasion, Mr Harvey. <laughs> Presiding officer, in developing world-leading renewable technologies and acquiring this expertise, Scotland has the opportun opportunity not just of reducing our own carbon emissions, but of helping the rest of the world to do so too. And if we're going to help save the planet, we'll have to do so on the basis of good science and good sense. 
We'll have to do so on the basis of a reasonable and a rational approach. And that's why I'm glad that the Scottish Government have set up the expert scientific panel to advise it on unconventional gas, whilst at the same time taking steps to strengthen planning and environmental protection. It's also why I'm dismayed at the effects of the UK Government energy market reform. It's why I'm disappointed at the UK Government's delay in implementing the recommendations of Ofgem's project Transmit, which offers at least a partial solution to the disproportionate transmission charging regime. And it's why I'm disappointed at their failure to invest in upgrading the grid, not least in providing interconnectors to Scotland's islands, which could generate 5% of the UK's electri electricity requirement by 2030. Because there is another way of achieving the end that Alison Johnson and I would both wish to see, meeting our climate change targets. And that is by advancing our very significant renewable energy opportunity. This has the advantage of improving and not diminishing our economic performance, of creating jobs and not destroying them, of reducing energy prices over time and not increasing them. Unfortunately, the UK government has been hindering and not helping meet this objective, which is why Alison Johnson and I agree that we'll make much more progress on this issue and many others after independence. Thank you very much. Michael Biagi. Oh, sir. Uh, to anyone on EET committee, this is a very familiar topic, but there we're used to seeing Murdo Fraser uh, curb his great enthusiasm so as to retain convener-like composure. I have to say, for his sake and for everybody else's sake, I'm glad he's had the chance to let loose today. It, his uh, UK government's headlong rush into uh, peppering rural England with unconventional gas sites, I, I find quite remarkable, not just in contrast with the more cautious and evidence-based approach of this Scottish government, but also because it comes from a party who, in past manifestos, used to hold local opposition to be so sacrosanct that they proposed a moratorium on onshore wind farms. Take the plans, roll on a few years, and we can easily foresee the point where the well-to-do villagers are marching instead against gas wells and where wind farm protests are last decade. This isn't the big sky country of the US with 100 miles between homes, no communities in between. Every drilling site has someone for a neighbour. There may be, there, there probably will be communities who would welcome unconventional gas. Doubtless, there are communities who would, on balance, welcome a large-scale return to open-cast coal mining for all the environmental difficulties it would cause. But if these communities exist today with their arms outstretched for shale gas, I do not see them. The updating of uh, planning policy will strengthen the hand of these communities, whichever their view, and is to be enthusiastically welcomed. But for me, this debate's motion is very narrowly and perhaps a little excessively focused on one aspect of fossil fuel extraction, when in truth, I think the instinct of the proposer is to object to it in all its aspects. We live in a, a nation that is committed to reductions in fossil fuel use and a world that should be. For some, it's an inconvenient truth, but for us, it's a legislative reality. And recently I participated in an event in the Science Festival where an audience member asked us on the panel about what a Scottish energy mix in the 2020s would be. All of us, including Dr David Toke, renewables expert, consultant to European Greens, agreed for the need to use gas as a step-down fuel, to, to some surprise from the questioner. Per unit, as we've heard, releases less carbon than coal, with CCS even less. And while Scotland will generate enough renewable electricity to meet our annual demand by 2020, gas is needed for the peaks and troughs because it can be dialed up and dialed down more flexibly than nuclear or any other competitor. And in heating, gas will continue to be with us for some time to come. Both of these have to be taken into account in our emissions trajectory, our world leading emissions trajectory, and they are. But against that, that must be held the danger of drawing investment away from renewables, as nuclear has unquestionably done south of the border. Final the minute. carbon costs of extraction, which are higher, the more unconventional your method, and indeed the question of safety in an industry where competing claims have left doubts that thus far have not reassured those who would see fracking next door. 
So there should be two lenses for considering unconventional gas. Firstly, the right of individuals to live in communities that are clean and safe, but also communities that are really in control of their own future, a principle I hold to whether the community is local, national or supranational. And secondly, the need for us as a society to reduce overall carbon emissions. These should be the evidence tests, not just for unconventional gas, but for all energy. And that includes renewables, a field where I think, while most welcome our tremendous progress, is one where most would welcome and, uh, and for, want us to further encourage projects where communities aren't just the neighbours, but also the principal initiators, owners and benefactors of the energy generated from their surroundings. Thank you. We now turn to closing speeches. Call on Jamie McGregor. Maximum four minutes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm pleased to close today's debate for the Scottish Conservatives. A number of members have rightly referred to the importance of energy security, as our amendment does, and I want to emphasise the importance of energy security, not least in the light of some of the political events involving Russia in the last few months. We cannot ignore the fact that 10 years ago the UK was a net exporter of gas, but now we have to import billions of cubic tonnes of gas each year to meet demand. As Murdo Fraser pointed out, much of that comes from Pennsylvania to Grangemouth, and I'm sure they would like a more local supply. The chief executive of Centrica, Sam Raidlaw, said recently, by 2020, we will be reliant on imports to meet 70% of the country's gas needs. So when it comes to security of supply, there is a pressing need for some solutions. The Scottish Conservatives have consistently argued that our energy supply must come from as diverse a range of sources as possible, and this remains our position. And I was pleased last week to host a briefing in Parliament on the excellent work that is being done on nuclear fusion research at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy, a potential energy source in the medium long term that could be transformational. But given our view that energy should come from a broad range of sources, we therefore believe it would simply not be responsible or sensible to ignore the potential of shale gas extraction and a coal bed methane as well. Rather, we should seek to exploit our unconventional gas reserves as other nations have done uh, with much success in a sensible manner and the one that ensures the appropriate environmental safeguards are in place. A number of the concerns about unconventional gas extraction are based on worries about risks which are similar to those associated with conventional coal, coal mining and oil and gas exploration and which are covered by regulations in these sectors. I understand because of the more intense nature of sh shale gas extraction, the process, it is associated with more negative impacts than conventional drilling. But issues like water contamination risks associated with, associated with hydraulic fracking can be covered by regulation from SEPA and minimised by proper well integrity design. The UK government has rightly shown support for the industry and the Scottish government should seek to emulate the efforts of the Office of Unconventional Gas and Oil in terms of streamlining legislation in that area. And I'm also aware that the fifth report of the House of Commons Energy and Climate Change Committee suggested that offshore shale gas might potentially dwarf onshore gas. Although it is not economically viable at present, I hope that the UK government might at some stage in the future consider using tax breaks to incentivise this exploration. Final minute. In terms of the climate change angle, we would also recognise that burning shale gas in the USA has also displaced significant amounts of coal burning and resulted in a fall in CO2 emissions by around 450 million tonnes in five years. To conclude, presiding officer, we cannot support calls to ban unconventional gas extraction as there is too much potential from these sources to help boost our economy and increase the security of our future energy supply. We recognise that shale gas is still at an exploratory stage in the UK well, there are opportunities for coal bed methane. This is known as coal seam gas in Australia, where advances have been made, especially in Queensland and New South Wales. We look to the Scottish Government to work as constructively with companies in this field as it does with those in the conventional oil and gas sector, and I support the amendment in the name of Mur Murdo Fraser. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Claudia Beamish. Maximum four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
I thank Alison Johnson for bringing this debate to the Chamber today, which is a very important debate in the context of our energy security and also um, where, where we're going for our future. Scottish Labour does have grave concerns about fuel poverty and the stark choices too many people here in Scotland are facing about whether to heat their homes or eat properly. This afternoon's debate on wealth and income inequality gives, gave a chance for further exploration of these areas as well and Scottish Labour argues for a way forward with a moral economy. There is, however, evidence that even if coal bed methane extraction was to proceed in Scotland, as we have heard from others today, it would not bring down energy prices because there would never be the critical mass there has been in the States. Friends of the Earth have argued that rather than being plentiful, cheap and clean, unconventional gas in Scotland can only ever be, and I quote, scarce, expensive and dirty. And there has certainly been some controversy over whether or not its explo exploitation will have an impact on energy prices. Deutsche Bank, among others, remains sceptical about, about the economic impact of environmental gas extraction here. Rather, as stated in our motion, it will not drive down energy prices for hard-pressed consumers, ren rendering a price freeze and reform of the energy market urgent. It has been valuable to have briefings from WWF Scotland, Friends of the Earth Scotland, and, our, and um, the Royal Society for Protection of Birds today. There's been much evidence and research about the environmental and health concerns from other countries. Some of it is conflicting, but there are certainly causes for concern. The ongoing scientific evidence by the expert panel will be watched carefully and scrutinised by many beyond Scottish Government. It is a difficult time of uncertainty for communities which might be affected, though there are at present no applications for the fracking, fracking process itself. Scottish Labour has consistently called for the Scottish Government to introduce robust guidelines, which has been acknowledged will, hap will happen today. It is also essential that the strategic environmental impact assessment process being called for by Friends of the Earth Scotland is in place. I was involved as a community activist during the 1990s in relation to guidelines for open cast mining, where we managed to get better distances between communities and excavation. I'm keenly aware of the importance of ensuring that guidelines are right from the start before any application can be considered. My colleague Claire ba Baker and I have questioned ministers on the Scottish Government's policy towards, dis towards distances, and I particularly want to explore the relationship between operations and residential and water protected areas and the Minister for Local Government and Planning has assured me in a, in a written answer that this will be part of the Scottish planning uh, policy in June and I hope that the minimum distances that need to be respected are there in robust guidelines. We should, surely have the adoption, we should surely be adopting the precautionary principle for a range of reasons. As the Chamber has heard on many occasions, there is, uh, Scotland has world-leading climate legislation, but it is vital this is met with, with action. And while it could be used as a, as a transition fuel, there are still many question marks over, over this whole process. We in the Scottish Labour Party support renewables, as in our motion, and energy efficiency going hand in hand. The pathway to community renewables is often a rocky one, and coincidentally I will be hosting a MOOC or massively open online courses uh, workshop tonight to support communities in taking this forward. The Cabinet Secretary argued for transformational change. In this shift, let's be sure that Scotland gets it right and is fair to our communities and for our future. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary, maximum six minutes, please. Officer, this has been a, a good debate. Uh, it's not been a debate of agreement because there has clearly been legitimate policy dis differences across the parliamentary chamber, but it's been a debate that's been expressed with uh, courtesy and respect, perhaps with the exception of uh, Mr Fraser's bombast, uh, where if, if, it, if it allows him to relieve himself of the burdens of convenership, then we all quite understand <laughs> uh, that these things have to happen every so often. But uh, I think there's been an honest exchange of views within the chamber um, and, and ranging across a, a, a range of different points of view, with the Green Party making it um, pretty clear that uh, they do not support um, any of the uh, forms of um, uh, onshore oil and gas development that uh, uh, have been talked about, um, 
the Conservatives, I think, encouraging, well, not quite a, to happen everywhere, but certainly a, a more enthusiastic response. Although I thought uh, Mr McGregor was somewhat more measured in his uh, summing up than Mr Fraser had been in his opening. Um, and the Labour Party calling for the government to bring forward more guidance on these issues. Um, there is more guidance on its way in terms of the Scottish planning policy, but I do want to reiterate what I said earlier on, that the, the government's environment, or the country's environmental regulator, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, published its guidance on shale gas and coal bed methane in December 2012. So that, you know, from the benefit of Margaret McDougall, I think it is important to reiterate the fact that that guidance has been put in place. In addition to that, the... Uh, of course, I will, yes. John McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for uh, taking this intervention. Um, I, I welcome the more cautious approach of the Scottish Government to unconventionals, and I also welcome uh, the fact that planning policy has been tightened up. However, for my constituents in uh, Canonby and in Fries and Galloway, the planning policy doesn't apply retrospectively, and uh, there have been some concerns raised about links between some members of the expert panel and the and the industry. I wondered what reassurances he could give to my constituents in both those regards. Cabinet Secretary. What, what, what I can say is that the expert panel has been selected on the basis of the, um, the scientific expertise that the individuals have to offer, and the government will consider carefully the material that is forthcoming. And of course, as an indication, it relates to the point that Joe McAlpine has just raised with me about planning policy. Um, in the draft planning policy, the Scottish planning policy, uh, in relation to unconventional oil and gas development, the government introduced buffer zones between um, potential developments and communities, indicating very clearly the government's determination to listen to the views of communities and to uh, ensure environmental protection is put in place. Now, that merited the following response from the head of campaigns, a friend of their Scotland, who said, it is a firm step in the right direction. Uh, we uh, welcome the government's recognition that buffer, no buffer zones are necessary, and the directive WWF Scotland said we welcome this commitment. So I think there's a, 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 I think a pretty broad endorsement of the direction the government is taking in an evidence-based, um, clearly um, uh, evidence-led process to uh, determine the contents of our policy framework. And of course, that will come back to Parliament for uh, consideration in due course. Marco Biaggi uh, raised the issue of community involvement in many aspects of renewable energy development. And I just want to make the point that uh, I agree entirely with the aspirations that Mr Biaggi has set out here. Um, local benefits must be at the heart of our vision for renewable energy in Scotland. Um, we um, we've put that issue centre stage in the development with the objective of achieving a target of at least 500 megawatts of community and locally owned renewables by 2020. And that's to provide a clear structure to the realisation of community benefit arising out of renewable energy. The government has set out a very clear and measured approach to the handling of what is a sensible set of issues. I want to reassure Parliament we will do so on the basis of clear guidance, on the basis of a considered assessment of all of the evidence, and with our environmental regulators acting as they always act, um, very clearly and implicitly in the interests of the, uh, the people of Scotland and in the protection of the uh, important natural environment uh, that surrounds us all. And these considerations will be at the heart of all steps the government takes to advance these issues um, as we bring forward the Scottish planning policy and consider uh, other contributions that we make to this debate as we, uh, uh, as we assess all of the relevant issues on an important issue to the people of Scotland. Many thanks. And I now call on Alison Johnston to wind up the debate. Maximum eight minutes, please. Um, thank you, presiding officer. Fracking and other forms of extreme energy, such as coal bed methane and underground coal gasification, have dominated the public debates on energy over the last year. Caroline Lucas, Green MP for Brighton Pavilion, was arrested and subsequently acquitted for taking part in a day of action against fracking at Balcombe in West Sussex. I thank all members for their contributions this afternoon. The Cabinet Secretary makes it clear that the government is taking an evidence-based approach and that planning policy will be strengthened with a buffer zone to protect local communities. Um, but as I suggested earlier, that while we can make it as safe as possible to extract these gases, it simply will not be possible to make it safe 
to burn those gases. But I do welcome the fact that the government are giving this issue serious consideration. Um, Ian Gray either mistakenly or mischievously suggested that we were conflating different types of unconventional gas extraction. I want to reassure him that we are not conflating hydraulic fracturing with coal bed methane. He then went on to conflate nuclear power with clean energy. Um, um, no, I'd like to make some progress, Mr Gray. Order. Um, Murdo Fraser suggested that those who were expressing concerns about some of the health impacts that it, to them, he suggested, it was merely pseudoscience. And I would politely suggest that the greenest government ever is merely pseudo-politicking. And I would like to point out also that this week, in a confirmed case from just two weeks ago, a fracking company in Texas were ordered to pay $3 million in compensation to a family who suffered chronic nosebleeds, irregular heartbeats, muscle spasms, and even open sores as a, as a result of the drilling chemicals. This is not pseudoscience. This is an area that we should consider with great concern. Um, no, I'm going to make progress, Mr. Fraser. Um, I agree entirely with Rob Gibson's comments with regard to using Scotland's skilled energy workers. There are many opportunities in the renewables industry. We currently are providing over 11,000 jobs, and I will work with anyone who wants to see those numbers increase. Um, Margaret McDougall advocates community ownership, but it's highly unlikely that unconventional gas will lend itself yeah, yeah. to such a model. And Mike McKenzie, Mike McKenzie accused the Greens of short-termism. Um, <laughs> frankly, I find that absolutely astonishing. It's short-termism that encourages you to think that extracting unconventional gas is any sort of an answer to our climate and energy challenges. It's long-termism when you think about investing in every single home in Scotland in terms of insulation. And if we properly skilled our builders and workmen and enabled them to treat all the hard-to-treat homes and tenements in buildings in this country, that would provide another jobs revolution. I'd like to, you know, just, just so that Ian Gray is aware that I understand the differences between fracking and coal bed methane extraction. Fracking involves pumping millions of tonnes of water down a well under high pressure. Coal bed methane extraction involves pumping massive quantities of water out of coal beds to lower the pressure and to extract gas over a large area. And there are inevitably escapes into the atmosphere. These fugitive emissions are important to consider Methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, especially over the 20-year timescale in which we must tackle climate change. Sir. Alec Johnson. Mr Johnson, could you address your microphone, please? Mr Johnson, is your card done? I was just going to say that the, the, the synergy of the two operations is one that you could actually do side by side. Could we not take the water you're bringing up one well and pump it down the other? Alison Johnston. Uh, thank you for your intervention, Mr Johnston. Uh, the first couple of studies to actually measure rather than estimate methane emissions at unconventional gas sites in the US are damning. They report data that is an order of magnitude greater than the US government estimates. And if these findings are replicated, it means unconventional gas is significantly more damaging than estimated and its usefulness as a lower carbon bridging fuel is under severe threat. The vast quantities of contaminated water that need to be treated and the large number of wells that will need, be needed should the development at Earth proceed all risk contamination. Toxic BTEC chemicals, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene and xylenes are all naturally occurring in coal beds and they're harmful to human health if they get into the soil or into our water courses. And the Friends of the Earth Scotland briefing for today describes numerous pollution in incidents. Um, Jamie McGregor touched on energy, energy security, which was another theme running through the debate. We do import gas, which costs money, and of course the profits go elsewhere. By far the largest chunk comes from Norway and the Netherlands and Belgian pipelines, and other imports are liquefied natural gas from Qatar and elsewhere. But real energy security comes from reducing, ending our dependence on gas. 
We know that signif significant unconventional gas won't come on stream for another decade, whereas the renewable industry in Scotland is already well past fledgling. The planned offshore turbines will be bolstering our power sector before unconventional gas. The 20 or so jobs on offer at Dart Energy site in Earth don't compare at all to the 11,000 people already employed in Scotland's renewable sector who have been mentioned by many colleagues in this debate. And as I've said, when it comes to community benefits, renewables wins hands down. It's an adaptable model. It's one that lends itself to community involvement and community ownership in a way that nuclear power or unconventional gas simply cannot or will not do. Presiding officer, the cheapest power station is the one we don't have to build. As well as supporting the renewable sector, there's a transformation in energy efficiency waiting for our homes if we'd only invest in it. There's buildings and businesses to support. About 40% of our gas is used in domestic properties to heat and cook. So there's so much more that we can do if only we would give proper time and consideration to energy efficiency. I don't know if people think it's a dull topic or if they feel they've debated it once too often, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a topic we cannot debate enough. Bringing Scotland's leaky homes up to good quality and rolling out district heating schemes will lower fuel costs. That way, that's how we lower our reliance on gas. There are many other opportunities too, whether we look at waste from anaerobic digesters or other emerging technologies. But we don't have to rely on unconventional gas to fuel or to power Scotland. And I really do hope that the government, as the Earth Development proposal rolls forward, will give it due consideration, realise that it is entirely incompatible with your own climate change targets and turn that proposal and any future proposal down. Thank you. Many thanks. That concludes the debate on energy and climate change, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll allow a few seconds for members to change places, but once again, I have to say that we are very, very tight for time in this next debate as well. So if members could bear that in mind when making their contributions. Thank you. Um, I now call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move the motion. Mr Harvey, 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, for me, green politics begins with the recognition that the ecological crisis we're facing and the social crisis we're facing both stem from the same broken economic system. So our choice uh, of two topics today seeks to reflect that balance. And in proposing a, a motion on wealth and pay inequality, we do so at a time of increasing global debate about that subject. Over recent years, we've had those debates informed by the likes of the spirit level by uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, by the work of the First Minister's favourite Nobel laureate, uh, Joe Stiglitz, as well more recently as Thomas Piketty. In Scotland, the work of organisations like Oxfam, Carnegie Foundation, uh, the Reid Foundation and the STUC have also helped to develop the idea of an economy which measures more than simply how much economic growth is being generated, but how fairly is it being shared. And just this week, we've seen work from uh, the Roundtree Foundation, from SCVO and indeed uh, research published by the Sunday Herald at the weekend, which further this debate as well in the Scottish context. It's going to be difficult to have this debate without the referendum context creeping in as well. And obviously, members on both sides of that debate will have their view. There'll be those who say the Scottish Government can and must do more now. Others will say we need the full powers of independence. The motion deliberately does not seek to get into that. Members on all sides know the Green position, know some of the reasons why I'll be voting yes. But our purpose with this debate today is to seek agreement on the objective goal of reducing inequality in wealth and income. So that whichever decision the Scottish people make, none of us can walk away from that. And it goes deeper than... Um, I beg your pardon, I've turned two pages. Uh, 
the, the, the Labour and SNP amendments neither seeks to remove most of the commitments in the, the motion on progressive redist and redistributive taxation, uh, decent wages instead of subsidised poverty pay, and the need to address high pay as well as low pay. So I'm glad that neither of the two large parties are seeking to remove uh, most of that. Very often the debate on inequality focuses on safety net policies, benefits, minimum wage, living wage. Let's recognise, though, that safety nets can all too easily develop holes. The creation of a legal minimum wage was a really important step. The advancement of a living wage is a better one. But employers will still find ways uh, to exploit people, tactics like zero-hour contracts or the outsourcing of low-wage work to other companies to allow them to claim the public credit for paying the living wage to their own direct employees while still exploiting uh, the labour of, of people in poverty. Even this Parliament, Deputy Presiding Officer, has been in that position, despite the clear political will of the majority of its own members. The welfare system is supposed to be another safety net, but it's time to recognise just what the UK's welfare state has come to. It not only allows poverty to continue, it takes people living with the stress of that poverty and heaps further stress upon them. It can be demeaning, humiliating and patronising and all too often it seems to be designed that way. And it goes deeper than specific measures like the vicious bedroom tax we discussed earlier today. It's about the values as well. For years, divisive, divisive rhetoric has been used. Benefit cheats, scroungers versus strivers and that old favourite hard-working families. This divisive rhetoric is used by political and media voices alike to undermine the human empathy that a welfare state depends on, presenting the false notion that there are those who contribute and those who only take. The reality is that we all depend on a successful welfare state, every single one of us. And apart from the hoarders and tax dodgers among the super rich, we all contribute as well. So this isn't just about whether a welfare system is run by an independent Scotland, by a devolved Scottish Government or by the UK Government. It's about the urgent need to win again from first principles the argument for a welfare state, a society in which we're all looked after and where all people's dignity matters. So we need more than just a safety net agenda. We can't close the gap between rich and poor without addressing both sides of that gap, high pay as well as low pay. And pay levels matter not just at the top and the bottom, but across the whole population. We remain a very low wage economy by EU standards, with half of working Scots earning less than £21,000 a year. Progressive taxation also has to be part of the picture, both in relation to income and wealth taxes as well, but also the structure of the economy especially in a period of low growth, as many expect over the coming years and perhaps decades, we risk seeing wages stagnate while investment by the richest continues to pay back for them. Now, if that happens, we will continue to see wealth accumulated in the hands of those who are already wealthiest. And we'll never achieve either the fairer, more equal, healthier and happier society that we should be seeking or if we don't close the gap between rich and poor, nor will we achieve the political consent that's needed for a welfare system that deserves the name, one that's focused on human welfare instead of bullying people into low-wage work. I want to welcome... Uh, yes, I'll give way. Gavin Brown. Does the member acknowledge, though, that the spend on welfare is almost £200 billion out of a budget of about 670 and that it's far more than anything else we spend money on? Harvey. I think it's far more important than more or less anything else we spend money on to ensure that human dignity is protected and that all people have the ability to live with dignity. I want to welcome the uh, Labour amendment. I do want the Scottish Government to show some bullishness on the issue of how we can use procurement law uh, in relation to living wage and a host of other issues and to be willing, if necessary, to test the boundaries of EU law. They've rightly shown that bullishness in the case of alcohol pricing. I think they should show the same uh, in this area as well. As for the Conservative amendment, I wasn't really surprised that the Conservatives put in an amendment that I didn't agree with very much, 
But let's just pick apart a few aspects. Making work pay. Well, that prompts the question, whose work and how much should it pay? Let's remember that the UK government, the Tory-led UK government, actually opposed the cap on bankers' bonuses uh, at the EU level. The idea that poor people must be made to work harder by paying them less and rich people must be made to work harder by paying them more is one that still seems to hold sway in the UK government. And how about those who can't work, either because of disability or because work isn't available uh, or because work of a, a decent sort can't fit in with their other commitments like caring for children or relatives? It comes back to that divisive rhetoric about hard-working families. We should be committed to building an economy that provides for all people, every single one of us, to live with dignity. The, the Tory motion also mentions tax allowances, the changes there. And let's be very clear, the changes to tax allowances have been regressive. The greatest percentage net change in household incomes has gone to the wealthiest, while three million of the poorest households gained nothing from that policy. Gavin Brown and I, and others on very high incomes, as all members of this chamber are on very high incomes, we're paying less tax as a result of that policy. David Cameron has even bragged that people on incomes as high as £100,000 a year are paying less because of that policy. And he also cites in his amendment uh, the, the increase to minimum wage levels. Well, I, I wish minimum wage levels had been increased as far as a living wage, but let's just recognise £6.50 is what the uh, over 20-year-old minimum wage is being increased to. That's more than a pound below, more than a pound an hour below the living wage. And in itself isn't the minimum wage, because for 18 and 20-year-olds, it's £5.13. For 16 and 17-year-olds, it's £3.79. And for apprentices, it's a meagre £2.73. So let's just recognise uh, that the increase there is pretty paltry. As for the government amendment, I won't be supporting that either, partly because it deletes the proposal merely to investigate the idea of wage ratios. But I also want to say this. There is more that we can do now to tackle wealth and income inequality uh, in, in the devolved context. It is, however, arguable that we can only do so properly with the powers over tax and benefits. But as I made clear earlier, this debate remains relevant whatever the outcome of the referendum. And it's the wider question, one of political direction, not just constitutional choices, that we're seeking to raise today. Underneath all of that, there's a question of values. And I do have a, a degree of optimism that the obsession with super wealth is giving way to a wider cultural acceptance that it's sustainable quality of life that should be the aspiration for individuals in a modern society. Whatever we can do to promote and, and push forward that transition uh, to a society that doesn't fetishise vast wealth, uh, we should do. And I hope this motion helps to do that. I move it uh, today, Deputy Presiding Officer. Many, many thanks. I now call on Margaret Burgess to speak to and move Amendment 9926.3. I'm pressing your request to speak button now, Mrs. Burgess. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, there's not a lot of what I would disagree with what Patrick Harvey has said in his opening remarks. Uh, I think it is uh, something that we're all concerned about in this chamber, about the growing gap between the rich and the poor, and, and that's certainly something that very much concerns the Scottish Government. And that's why our economic strategy and national performance framework include cohesion and solidarity targets designed to increase equality and to reduce the disparities between different sections of our society. Because there is no doubt that Scotland is a prosperous nation, rich in natural and human resources, yet still far too many people and communities are trapped in poverty and prevented from realising their full potential. And I find it utterly depressing that our first detailed analysis of UK government data on wealth and assets in Scotland, which was published today, shows that 30% of all households in Scotland have almost no wealth, meaning they don't own property, don't have a private pension or savings, or own items such as cars and household goods. The report also shows that these households simply don't have the income needed to gain the wealth and security that so many of us take for granted. But based on current evidence and past performance, I don't believe that the UK Government will take the actions necessary to break this cycle of deprivation. 
The reality is that over the years, the Westminster system has failed to properly address the deep social inequalities which exist in Scottish society, with generation after generation feeling the impact. And I do believe that Scotland needs to have full control of all economic levers to tackle and reverse these inequalities. Only independence would give the Scottish Parliament the power that it needs to pursue a fairer economic model. I'll give way. Gavin Brown. Grateful to the Minister for Commun Clearly, income tax is important in all of this. What changes would her government make to income tax were we to become independent? Minister. I think there's been uh, lots of evidence shown, and the Institute of Fiscal Studies has also said that one way to define a tax system is based on principle and start out. And the best way to do it is a new, a new state to have a fairer system. We have a UK tax system with 10 thousand pages of rules and regulations. We have a UT tax system with over a thousand exemptions. So we would create a system that was fairer, that was um, allowed us to sustain public services and encourage economic growth. And full fiscal I'll give way I'll give what Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the Minister giving an intervention and we would all have a lot in common. To what extent do you believe cutting corporation tax and giving breaks to the Amazons and, and uh, Starbucks of this world is going to help reduce inequality? I think, uh, I think it does, because it, what, what it will do is um, make us competitive, get the jobs into Scotland, over 27,000 additional jobs in Scotland, and we would make sure, because we do support the living wage and have a living wage policy, and also we'd make sure that the corporation taxes paid their taxes, and that's another thing we would do in an independent Scotland. We would tackle tax avoidance and come down heavy in those companies that don't pay. So that, that's another way of doing it in a new system. M meantime, we are doing what we can to tackle, within the limited powers we have, to tackle this huge inequality. Because, make no mistake about it, we do accept there is a huge inequality. And this includes the actions set out in our child poverty strategy and maximum household incomes, improving children's well-being and life chances, and ensuring each and every one of us can live in a sustainable home and community. And it's simply unacceptable that in a wealthy nation such as ours that we know that a third of our children are not getting the start in life that they deserve. And particularly in a nation like Scotland, when the latest analysis shows that if Scotland were an independent country, we'd be the 14th, 14th wealthiest in the OECD. And at this time, um, when the UK government's austerity programme is placing households under increasing financial pressure, and we all know that they're under increasing financial pressure, we are defending and extending certain core services, rights and benefits through the social wage, free personal care for the elderly, abolishing tuition fees, ending bridge tolls, abolishing prescription charges, free eye examinations, freezing council tax, concessionary bus travel, increasing the provision of free nursery education, free school meals for primaries one to three from January 2015. But we also take the, um, the issue of low pay very seriously. We take the issue of low pay. No, I'm, right, I'm sorry, I've, I've given two interventions already. We've introduced the living wage across the sectors of the public service that we are directly responsible for. We're encouraging the living wage uh, throughout the public sector. We've taken direct action to raise the minimum rates of pay for those parts of the public sector under our responsibility with a minimum pay uplift of £300 a year for those earning less than £21,000. We're funding the Poverty Alliance pilot to encourage um, employers and private organisations to become accredited as living wage employers. The measures of the Scottish Government are taken go far beyond any measures the UK Government is putting in place for the lower paid. In addition, the we haven't got a Labour government and we're not likely to get one either, the way they're behaving. In addition, and the Deputy First Minister announced proposed amendments to Stage 3 of the Procurement Reform Bill, which Patrick Harvey uh, alluded to in his um, statements, to make it explicit that the guidance about bidder selection will address remuneration and pay on the living wage. And make no mistake about it, this Scottish Government is committed to supporting and promoting the Scottish living wage. Local authorities and contractors are well aware of what is expected of them as regards the living wage, and we are doing everything and 
still in negotiation with the EU on looking at if there's anything further we can do in the procurement bill. But we are very clear in it. We support the living wage and we've done it by action in what we've done across uh, the Scottish Government and the public services and the funding we're giving to the, the, the Poverty Alliance. But every effort we are taking has been hindered by the impact of the UK Government welfare reforms. And it's clear, and Patrick Harvey is absolutely you know, right. Ministers, in our last 20 seconds. The welfare system is broken and can't work for Scotland. So I hear him in my last 20 minutes. So my final 20 seconds. Sorry, I thought I had another 20 <laughs> minutes, presiding officer. I will simply say that I do believe that we can only pro properly address po poverty and inequality when the Parliament does have full control over all its resources, and that includes taxation and benefits. Then we can properly address uh, inequality and wealth in Scotland. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. Now I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 9926.1. Five minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Presiding officer, can I start by welcoming the opportunity to debate wealth and income inequality and thank, thank Patrick Harvey for bringing the subject to the Chamber, but also to welcome very much the approach he's taken, because Labour will be supporting the motion at decision time, because he's made the debate about political will and doing what's right, and not about constitutional change, and I respect him for doing that. I share the aspiration expressed in the motion for a fair and successful society, and I also recognise that in order to do so, we need progressive policies that make work pay and seek to redistribute wealth. Labour is a party founded on the principle of sharing wealth to create a more equal society. It is very much at the heart of all that we do. We are putting in place bold policies to tackle inequality. We have proposals for a progressive system of taxation so that those with the broadest shoulders should bear the biggest burden. We have a freeze on energy prices because we recognise that struggling families should not have to choose between heating and eating. And we are supporting a living wage because we need to make work pay. It's interesting that none of those progressive policies are supported by the Tories, as you would expect, but they're not supported either by the SNP. And yet we know the costs are rising and wages are declining. A recent Joseph Rowntree report on minimum income standards tells us that a basket of essential goods has risen by a staggering 25% in the space of five years. And increasingly, people in and out of work are not making ends meet. I'm told that many of the people now appearing at food banks are those not just unemployed, but those in low-paid jobs, struggling to cope before their wages come in. And again, the SNP's only answer, evidenced by the Minister today, is irrespective of the question you ask them, is that independence will cure all ills. Do you know, I really say to you, it is genuinely disappointing that the Minister is not prepared to do anything now, but I suppose you could say it is consistent and so totally and completely lacking in ambition for people in communities across Scotland. It is interesting that, like the First Minister, she doesn't want a Labour government. Yeah. She suggested, or indeed the First Minister suggested, at the last election that they vote yeah. Liberal. I'm sure Willie Rennie was grateful for that. But, you know, what is it about the SNP that you actually don't want to see positive change, not just in Scotland, yeah. but across the United <laughs> Kingdom? But there is no, 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 we've always heard enough from you. No, there is no guarantee that changing the Constitution delivers the kind of progressive change that will deliver a fairer society. Yeah. It takes political will to do that. Yeah. Nothing progressive about the SNP's proposals, no. because remember, this is the party that wants to cut corporation tax by 3% more than even George Osborne wants to do it, that refuses, refuses to commit to a 50% top rate of income tax and that seems much more interested in protecting big businesses, bankers and the most wealthy. And where they have the opportunity to help some of the lowest paid in society, they are found wanting. Next week, presiding officer, is stage three of the procurement bill setting out important principles for how we spend £10 billion in public contracts each year. Here's the opportunity 
to do something about the living wage and zero hours contracts. Here is the opportunity to positively improve the income of 400,000 low paid workers, 64% of them who are women. But so far, they've set their face against improving the lot of the low paid, and the SNP is very good at talking, but they're less good when it comes to taking action. I'll give way to the Minister if she'll tell us now, will they change the procurement bill at stage three to include the living wage? Minister? Yes or no? And, and Jackie Bale is well aware that we are doing everything we legally can and we support as a government the living wage. That, that didn't sound like a yes to me. So they're Last setting their face seconds. again, again against this. I notice the Minister's amendment removes the final sentence of the Greens motion and they're rather can I say gentle request for the government to investigate wage ratios. I admit to being surprised because when Ken McIntosh brought this up at stage two of the procurement bill, Nicola Sturgeon said, I wholeheartedly endorse many, if not all of his comments. A mere few weeks ago, why has it now changed? Why is it removed from the motion? Presiding officer, low wages aren't good for individuals, they're not good for society, they're not good for the economy. We are caught between two governments with the wrong priorities. The Tories aren't progressive, the SNP pretend to be, but they offer nothing to change the lives of the people of Scotland. Many thanks. I call on Gavin Brown to speak to and move Amendment 9926.4. Mr Brown, five minutes, thank, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'll start by moving uh, the amendment in my name. And it will probably have come to no, as no surprise to the Green Party that we weren't going to support their motion and that our amendment uh, is of a completely different flavour to their original motion. We do not agree, uh, as you may uh, guess, with the thrust of what Patrick Harvey has said and what he is attempting to do. But I will say this for the Green Party. They are very clear about what they want to achieve and they are equally clear about how they would achieve it. They would bring in a completely different tax system. There would be a large increase in most taxes in order to pay for it. And at least in that sense, the Green Party position stacks up. We simply disagree with it for political reasons. Yes. The point I would make to Mr Harvey, where I did uh, take issue with his speech, though, he, he categorised the welfare system in the UK as designed to bully and demean. And while he didn't uh, say these particular words, he did repeat... Um, I think in spirit what the Scottish Government have said that the welfare system is being dismantled uh, by the coalition government. He didn't specifically say that but I do believe, I, but I do believe he, he alluded to that. How, he's saying it now fine. But he has to accept and I think everybody in the chamber has to accept the basic facts about what is spent on the welfare system in the UK. I put the statistics to him. Almost £200 billion pounds out, of, out of about £670 billion. Pounds. Now it is important it is important, Deputy Presiding Officer, but it is the largest single item of expenditure by the UK Government. Sure, of course. Adam, will you? Thank, I thank the member for giving way. Um, could he clarify then what is the spend on pensions? Gavin Brown. As the member probably knows, somewhere in the region of about 46% of the figure I gave of £200 million is related to pensions, which leaves you with well over £100 billion on other welfare measures, still considerably more than just about any other, de other department in the UK. And if other, parties, if other parties are unhappy with the expenditure on welfare, it is incumbent upon them to suggest how they would pay for it, given that it has grown far more than any other department. Now, I name check Mr Harvey, so I feel I ought to give Mr Harvey. I, I'm grateful. Very briefly, can I just point out to him that the figure of £100 million that he's arrived at now is not exactly eye-watering. It's what we would spend on about one mile of urban motorway in Scotland. Gavin yeah, Brown? Oh, it, 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 it was £100 billion. Pounds. Mr Harvey must have uh, misheard me. Uh, it's, it's over 50% of the original £200 billion, um, from my initial answer. So it's substantially uh, more than one mile of motorway. Even the Green Party, I think, can, uh, with their uh, liking of denouncing motorways, can realise that it's substantially uh, more than that. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, that's why I suppose we're disappointed, though, with the, the Scottish Government's position here, because they are suggesting that they would do things completely differently were we to be independent. But from what we've seen on paper from them, we know that that isn't true. There are no plans at all to change income tax from the Scottish Government. Mr Swinney has been at pains to reiterate that point. So they're making no changes to the tax system other than their pledge for corporation tax. As we found out last week, most of welfare would remain the same. 
the largest changes to the welfare programmes would remain the same. Not a single SNP member last week was able to contradict that. And where the SNP have had a choice, where they have had the levers and the powers, they have gone for universal benefits almost all of the time. If changing inequality was the most important thing to the Scottish Government, they would not have gone for universal benefits on just about every policy measure that they brought in. There was a large list of them from the Minister. All of them were universal, helping everybody as opposed to those who they claim to want to help. Now, my final minute, Deputy Presiding Officer, I just do want to put on the record some of the uh, conclusions of a report by David Bell and David Iser of the Stirling Management School, who did a study in inequality in Scotland. And I think it's just worth putting on the record some of the comments uh, made within that paper. Uh, now, they accept and they point out that gross income inequality is relatively high in the UK, although wealth inequality uh, less so. They point out that most of the growth, though, happened between 1975 and 1990, and that since the mid-90s, there has been virtually no increase in net income inequality. Yet at the same time, the Nordic countries that, that many on the left want to replicate have seen their inequality increase at a far faster rate than the United Kingdom. It's worth putting these points on the record, Deputy Presiding Officer. We accept that there are issues, but they are often, uh, the facts are often not put there on the table for the other side. I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. We're very tight for time. Call Willie Rennie to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I too am frustrated about the pockets of poverty which exist in our country. I think um, I'm, too, I'm impatient. I want to make that change. I want everybody to have a chance to get on in life. This is not a monopoly of those on the SNP benches about who care about these issues. It's why we must focus on the solutions rather than just the words. I admire the strong socialist rhetoric from the Greens, from Patrick Harvey today. But I have to say I'm rather puzzled by the timid solution. Often from Patrick Harvey we hear about bashing the rich, condemning the establishment, railing against inequality. So I would have expected something a bit more than what we have in the motion. Perhaps the nationalisation of all the major industries to control wages, an end to all bonuses for bankers, turning the living wage into the minimum wage, price controls, nationalisation of housing, or even just one socialist policy. Something that may just begin to match Patrick Harvey's powerful rhetoric, but no. What we have in this motion is a call for a proposal to conduct an investigation into the possibility of introducing at some point in the future a wage ratio policy. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no problem with an investigation. I'm sympathetic to the proposal. I just would have expected something a bit more radical than this. So substance in this motion does not match the rhetoric from the speech. But what was fascinating is that the Scottish Government can't even bring itself to support this. A proposal that the government, I would suggest, often uses the same kind of rhetoric as Patrick Harville. A proposal that they cannot bring themselves to support. Again, the rhetoric not even matching the timid proposal from the Green Benches. Contrast this with the action taken by the UK government. National minimum wage increased to a new £6.50 hourly rate which delivers an extra £355 a year for a full-time worker. A commitment from Vince Cable to support future rises too, as indicated by the Low Pay Commission. A big increase in tax thresholds that will deliver £700 back in the pockets of those on low and middle incomes, not high incomes, on low and middle incomes. It's going up to 10500 next year. And Liberal Democrats want that to go up to £12,500 so that no one on the minimum wage pays any income tax at all. But after last week's debate on this very subject, both the SNP benches and the Labour benches voted against that proposal. Now we know where they stand on cutting tax on low and middle incomes. Our tax cut has benefited over 2 million Scots and taken over... 200,000 out of tax altogether. And we have expanded childcare with tax allowances as well as a big expansion 
of childcare, giving children hope that they can reach their potential. We have also Members taken last action minute. to tackle tax avoidance, including 40 changes to tax law since 2010 to close down avoidance loopholes. And we are working with the G20 and the OECD in taking forward a 15-point action plan to counter base erosion and profit shifting. And we have limited the pay of the highest earners in the public sector and stopped massive increases in bankers' bonuses at RBS. Our delivery, our delivery is far more radical than an investigation about a possibility. Many thanks. Now call on John McAlpine to be followed by Hugh Henry. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, a number of people in the Chamber today will have had the privilege of attending the memorial a couple of weeks ago to the late Margot Macdonald, MSP. And during the tributes to Margot, um, it was her, ma her maiden speech in the House of Commons uh, was quoted when she was elected to Westminster. And she used her maiden speech as is traditional to uh, praise her predecessor, who was, of course, a, a Labour MP. And she quoted his maiden speech. Uh, from the 1940s, in which he condemned the poverty that his constituents were living in. And she made the observation that in 1973, the, the, her constituents in government were still experiencing levels of poverty and poor housing and deprivation. And it's 41 years since Margot won that by-election in Govan, and we know that today 870,000 people in Scotland still live in poverty despite the fact that for the last 33 years, Scotland has given more per head to London than it's got back. So clearly there is something wrong with the system. Uh, we're talking about successive Westminster governments of both Labour and Tory, um, wh who have failed to address the inequalities that she identified in her maiden speech and her predecessor identified in his maiden speech. And shortly after uh, Margot was elected, of course, we saw uh, Margaret Thatcher's ascent to power and that actually began to sharpen, I think most people understand that that began to sharpen levels of inequality, uh, particularly between the richest and the poorest, which have never been uh, rectified and through years and years of Labour government uh, under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, they weren't addressed. Now, I had intended in this speech to go on and talk about how this parliament had, uh, had addressed some of the inequalities uh, that uh, Margot had identified back in the 1970s and uh, in terms of the universal benefits introduced by both Labour and the SNP. But having listened to Jackie Bailey's speech, I just couldn't let it go. I thought it was the most partisan speech. Um, and so misleading. Um, we had years of Labour government at Westminster and, in, and here in Holyrood. You talk about household incomes. Under Labour, household incomes, households experienced a 60% rise in council tax. No, I'm not taking an intervention. Um, you failed to introduce a living wage. Correct. You allowed 600,000 people Correct. earning less than £16,000 a the chair, year please. to pay well, prescription you. charges. It was a Labour government in Westminster under Ed Miliband, the Energy Secretary, that allowed further deregulation of the energy market that saw a whopping rise in fuel bills. So I don't think that we need to take any lectures from Labour on eradicating poverty, because they had their chance. I wanted to finish off by saying that the motion, I, I believe, uh, the, the motion, um, by Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey said that he deliberately didn't uh, mention uh, independence, and I can understand why he wanted to uh, achieve a consensus. However, actually, the, 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 the substance of the motion talks about benefits and it talks about income inequality, and those are things that can only be changed if we have those powers here in this Parliament. So it's impossible to ignore independence in this debate. And we now know through the Child Poverty Action Group that another 100,000 children will be in poverty by 2020 if we continue you with the union. Close, and this please. Westminster government. So that's why Scotland must be independent if we're going to reduce inequality and reverse the mistakes of the past. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Now call on Hugh Henry to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think most people would accept that we live in an ill-divided world. 
We only need to reflect back on the, the terrible tragedy in Bangladesh when thousands lost their lives working in virtually slave conditions um, on low wages um, to produce goods that many of us are quite happy to buy uh, cheaply. We know that there are many grieving families in Bhopal that have not had justice for their loved ones who lost their lives in dreadful conditions there. And Barack Obama has called uh, income equality uh, one of the defining challenges of our times. And it's not just across the world that we see these ill-defined Ill problems. We have it here as well in this country, and many speakers have alluded to that. And yes, do you know something? It is really dead easy to point the finger of blame at others and say it's all their fault. Yeah. It is right to point to some of the failures of the last Labour government at Westminster, who probably didn't do enough to curb the greed and the excesses of the bankers. But I think at the same time, we should give due recognition to what Gordon Brown did with the introduction of working family tax credits and pensioner tax credits that help many of the poorest families in this country. So let's get a balance of what we're talking about. And it's right to talk about the failures of the Lib Dem uh, coalition, uh, 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 Tory coalition at Westminster and, and their failures. But, you know, are we going to say that the whole way that we approach politics in this Scottish Parliament is simply about defining the failures of others. Will we refuse to look at what we can do to actually make a difference? Because there are things, as Jackie Bailey has pointed out, that can be done by the Scottish Government at the present time. We don't, as Margaret Burgess and others have said, need to have independence to make a difference to the lives of many ordinary families in this country. We can do something with the procurement bill as has been said many times. But, you know, there are other things that could be done by the Scottish Government. We, yes, certainly can do more to help uh, the poor in this country and maybe look at restoring some of the poverty budgets that have been cut um, by, by the Scottish Government. But what about tackling the excesses at the top that are directly under the control of the Scottish Government? What about doing something about the, the money paid to the top executives in Scottish Water where you know, the chief executive in 11, 12 uh, can have a salary of 240,000 or the hundreds of thousands of pounds earned by the chief executive of Scottish Enterprise, something that can be done uh, by the Scottish Government or any of the health boards or any of the other uh, public organisations that the Scottish Government funds. And yes, the Labour Party should maybe be working with the Scottish Government to say, how can we help to control some of the excesses of the chief execs and, and, and others in local authorities that are earning obscene amounts of money compared to what the lowest paid are earning? So there is a lot that we can do. And, you know, it diminishes each and every one of us if all we can do is say that the fault lies with somebody else and there is nothing that we can do here. There is plenty that we can do in this Parliament. There is plenty that the Scottish Government can currently do. And we can start by curbing the excesses, yes, in the private sector that, you know, are obscene, but let's do something about the excesses in the public sector that are all within your control at the moment. Many thanks. Now, Colin John Mason to be followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I have to say I'm broadly supportive of this motion. I certainly do agree that we need to introduce rules and have the right rules and legislation, eh, both to tax income and wealth eh, and or eh, to limit incomes. Eh, I was particularly interested in the Conservative and the proposed eh, Lib Dem amendments. They both positively refer to the UK government, but there the similarity completely ends. The Lib Dems left the entire Green motion in place eh, with all the talk of taxation and limiting incomes while, by contrast, the Conservatives wiped out virtually the whole motion. And I have to say I'm pleased that the Government amendment leaves so much in. Specifically, we have the bit about progressive and redistributive wealth and income taxes. Absolutely right. I think we agree that income tax can be used to redistribute income, but we should not forget also that taxes like inheritance tax 
are necessary to help redistribute wealth. However, all of these taxes and laws have their limitations. People do find ways of increasing their income, get, uh, for example, by moving to other countries or at least getting part of their pay there, using overseas tax havens. And of course, there's the old argument that our businesses will not attract the best people if we do not offer competitive salaries. However, that latter argument has been somewhat undermined uh, by the fact that the UK already overpays people in comparable companies uh, compared to other countries. And paying high salaries clearly did not ensure that the banks were run well. I think one of the challenges we face in this issue is attitudes. How do we change attitudes? Because I do not believe that we are going to fully deal with inequality unless we can make progress in changing attitudes. And especially we need to change the acceptability of greed. Greed is a bad thing and we need to challenge it. But laws and regulations are not very good at changing people inside. We do seem to have become a more greedy society and there seems to be less of a moral sense in some people that if we've been fortunate and have done well, that we, we have a duty not to take an unfair share of the cake or at least to give a chunk of it back to the wider society. I would want to argue that faith has something to say in here, although I accept that there are people in the churches who have not always limited their incomes or given away as much as they could have. Jesus commended a poor woman who had very little but gave it all away, whereas richer people gave away ostentatious amounts but kept even more for themselves and their own comfort. So I would argue today that part of the answer to this problem is to change people's internal attitudes. That can be tackled in a range of ways, but certainly includes families and schools in the upbringing and education of children. Does television advertising encourage children to want more? If we're going to take control of broadcasting at some stage, that is something we will have to look at. And as Hugh Hen Henry has correctly said in his previous speech, the public sector is a factor in all this, and we could set an example. I agree that we should not be too interfering eh, in local government, but in Glasgow, for example, successive chief executives' pay has gone up much faster than staff in general. So whether that be the responsibility of Scottish local government, Scottish parliament or Scottish government, it certainly is a Scottish issue. However, I am willing to accept that Glasgow is competing with UK cities and we are not entirely masters of our own destiny. Did that applies close? to both public and private sectors. But at least we have to try. If we make an attempt to narrow the gap between top and bottom, that would be a start. And I certainly do not see the present UK government even attempting to do that. Many thanks. Now, Colin Alex Riley to be followed by Maureen Watt. Up to four minutes, very tight for time. Less would be more, please. Thank you, President Officer. I recently met with a group of home care workers um, and they were working in care homes in the private sector. And as the discussion went on, I realised that many of them had two things in common. Firstly, they were absolutely dedicated to caring for the people that were in the care homes that they worked in. And secondly, the majority of them were earning the minimum wage. And it strikes me that in terms of how we put value on people's, people's um, employment in this country, that, that people who are caring for others and anybody who's had a member of their family in a care home would say that, that people who are caring for others are worth much more than the minimum wage. But I remember as council leader in Fife that um, a couple of years ago, last year in fact, the Scottish Government did a deal with COSLA where the Scottish Government agreed with COSLA that care homes would be paid a 2.5% increase and indeed the Scottish Government had to put some of the money into that. And also as a leader in Fife, I was forever being lobbied by the care home owners who were consistently telling me that the cost of introducing the living wage would mean that they would go out of business. And I sometimes wonder whether the Scottish Government's reluctance to look at including the, the living wage within the procurement bill has more to do with the lobbying and potential costs than it does to do with, with the EU. The second point I would want to make is the report that came out today for the, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, which argues that the gap 
uh, that the gap began before children started school and widened as they got older. It also points out that uh, the study found that in early secondary school, only 28% of children from purer families were performing well in numeracy compared with 56% of those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And that is something that educationalists and social workers have been saying for years, that you could identify in the early years um, those children that are less likely to succeed in the education system and therefore less likely to succeed throughout their life and therefore more likely to be living on low incomes and living in deprivation and poverty. And that cycle of deprivation we see continuing and continuing within Scotland. And if we are to address that, then we have to focus our policies and focus them on the early years. And the Scottish Government a few years ago talked about a change fund for early years. In Five Council's case, Five Council made £7.8 million available for that change fund. The Scottish Government made not a penny available. The NHS was to be a partner within that. The NHS made not a penny available. And if we're serious about tackling the early years and getting in there and doing the work that Five Council is doing right now, then it needs money to be directed and resourced into those early years so that we improve the life opportunities so that when children are starting the school, they're starting the school with a level playing field. And if we continue to invest, in that needs a radical shift in policy. It needs a policy that recognises that in the poorer areas, those schools are underperforming. And there's much more that we can actually do there. Now, I've seen that in Fife. I've seen a priority. But what that requires is political will. And it needs, means the courage of your convictions to actually put the resources where they will make the biggest difference. The Scottish Government have failed to do that and should consider their policies if we're serious about tackling inequality. Thanks so much. Now Colin Maureen Watt, after which we move to closing speeches. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate. And I agree with many of the contributions that have already been made. Um, a few weeks ago, while tidying a pile of books, I happened again across the spirit level, as others have mentioned, and started to reread it. And I think that the propositions and analyses put forward by the authors of this book, together with the concept of the humankind in index, are very much worth exploring uh, further and working towards. We can't ignore the fact that within rich countries, life expectancy is determined by the size of the income gap. For example, Japan has a narrow gap benefiting the nation with the highest life expectancy. Japan and Scandinavia have lower crime rates and better uh, income equality, whereas the US and the UK have a wide income gap and thus higher crime rates. And these findings, of course, have been confirmed over many years by Carol Craig and others and their work at the Centre of Confidence and Wellbeing. Yes. Drew Smith. I, thank you, President Officer. I'm very grateful to the member for, for giving way. But does she appreciate that one of the key arguments contained within a book, uh, within the, the spirit level and the whole debate it started, is around wage differentials? And could you just explain, as none of the other government speakers have, why no, nobody in the SNP, why the SNP are supporting an amendment in Margaret Burgess's name, which takes out the one and only call that is in there to investigate that very issue? I mean, what? I think if we're going to make any significant difference in inequality, we have to have all the tools. You can't just tinker about at the edges. But, presiding officer, if I needed an extra incentive to campaign with all my might for independence, which of course I don't, it was a revelation a few weeks ago that the five richest families in the UK are worth more than £28.2 billion compared to the lowest 20% or £12.6 million people who are worth £28.1 billion. Across the world, also according to Oxford, uh, Oxfam Research, the richest 85 people share a combined wealth of £1 trillion, and that equates to that shared by the world's 3.5 billion poorest. And of course, in Scotland, we're not immune to this inequality, with the Sunday Herald reporting that the richest 10% of households in Scotland have 900 times the accumulated wealth of the poorest 10%. That's why the politicians and lawmakers on these benches want full power and responsibility over our economy to start redressing the balance 
because evidence tells us that under both the last Labour government and this Tory Lib Dem government, inequality is increasing in the UK as a whole. I'm old enough to remember in previous periods of recession, when London had a cold, Scotland got the flu. But with this Parliament and the SNP Scottish Government, we've been able to use our limited powers to mitigate some of the effects, but still it is the poorest who suffer, as we see with the rise of food banks. Why is it that under Westminster, tax avoidance and evasion is given a light touch approach, while welfare recipients are taxed with the harshest of penalties? Mm -hmm. Why are welfare budgets capped and budgets for Trident and Arms allowed to run out of control? Why are company directors allowed to scratch each other's back by offering small cliques absurd sums and fees and their chief executives huge sums on a never-ending spiral upward, which the public sector has to compete with. You draw to Having listened to Hugh Henry, though, I think obviously we're going to see government salaries, uh, uh, salaries in council start to come down in those that they control. In conclusion, presiding officer, examples, Last five seconds. Yeah, examples worldwide show that less inequality leads to a stronger economy and a society more comfortable with itself. And with Westminster records, we cannot wait for these parties opposite to do anything different. Thanks so much. Now move to closing speeches. Before I do, I'd just like to remind the members who have taken part in the debate that it should be in the chamber for the closing speeches. Mr Johnson, four minutes. Uh, they say of socialists that sooner or later they'll run out of other people's money. And when you hear some of the speeches that have been made in this chamber today, you realise that some of us may live long enough to see that point proven once again. The fact is that the left-wing consensus in this parliament offers Scotland nothing uh, except dishonesty. And when we hear the continuing repeating of the line that the gap between rich and poor is somehow increasing in Scotland today, uh, we hear something that the facts simply don't bear out. I aspire to a different approach. I believe that the, what we need in this country is smaller government, less regulation, lower taxation and a rebalancing between the public and private sectors. People should keep more of the money they earn, particularly those who are at the average and below average end of the wage scales. And that's why I'm proud of the record of this government, in or the, the UK government, between the Conservatives and our Liberal Democrat colleagues, who have done so much to take the low paid out of tax, in some cases altogether. It is vital that we understand what Scotland needs for its long-term prosperity. We should make sure that people keep more of the money they earn. We should make sure that we do not make the mistake highlighted by Margaret Burgess herself in her opening remarks, where she said that property ownership was one of the key measures of wealth. This, the housing minister, who is at the moment taking away the right for individual tenants to buy their own homes. A hypocrisy, if ever there was one. A separate Scotland, as they describe, uh, it seems would be in the business of seizing wealth and property, exploiting uh, the, the, that money for the benefit of what it saw as its priorities rather than the priorities of the people, creating what can only be descri described as a client economy, not an economy of independence, but one of dependence and nothing else. We are told again that the welfare system is broken and can't work for Scotland. But why is there no formal proposal for change? Why is there no budget for change? The truth is that this government has no intention of changing anything. And the more we ask, the more we are disappointed about where this will go. Surely, if we are to talk in this chamber about the redistribution of wealth, it is at least as important that we talk about the creation of wealth. And that is why we on this side of the chamber will continue to work and aspire towards full employment, to taking the low paid out of tax altogether, to giving the low paid the opportunity to own property and to acquire or accrue wealth over time. We believe that those who can work should work and should do so rather than rely on the tax paid by their neighbours for their livelihood. Those on higher incomes already pay a higher proportion of total income tax revenue than they did under the previous Labour government. 
The acute labour shortages that we see in the Scottish economy today in some areas show us that wages can be driven up in that economic environment. And these lessons need to be learned and applied elsewhere. Is we know that close? price fixing and wage fixing, as attempted by previous governments in the 1970s in particular, are le the lesson is that these have a disastrous and negative effect. I believe in liberal economic theory. I believe that we here in Scotland should apply it. And I believe the Green Party's approach is authoritarian socialist dogma of the worst possible kind. Thanks so much. I now call on Jenny Mara. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think it's been a very interesting uh, debate this afternoon um, with various points raised across the chamber. And I'd like to reflect on some of those points, if I may, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start with some of the remarks uh, that the Minister herself made. Because Margaret Burgess said to the Chamber that we're doing what we can to tackle inequality now with the available resources. I've sat in this Parliament for three years now, Presiding Officer, and I can say to the Minister that I believe that to be completely untrue. And it is evidenced today by a lot of the um, a lot of the reports that have come out. Today, uh, we were reflecting upon the Joseph Roundtree Foundation report, which talked about the attainment gap between the poorest households and the richest households. The children of the poorest households are not doing as well at school. And that gap isn't, isn't a small gap. It is a very wide gap. And the progress that this government has made with full control over education over the last eight years has been absolutely minuscule. Presiding officer, I heard of a school in my region um, that 40 per cent of the pupils in S1 had a reading and writing age of primary two. That in a developed a developed nation and a developed economy is absolutely disgraceful and it's something that we should be spending every minute in this parliament looking at. Alex Rowley, my colleague, made a very powerful speech this afternoon touching on a number of things and he talked about numeracy that is just not up to scratch either. Literacy and numeracy, two big problems in our education system and our poorest children not succeeding and not getting the support we need. You know, I sat in the education committee with Joan McAlpine, who also spoke this afternoon. We had a panel of educationalists in front of us and she put the question to those educationalists and she said, what more powers would we need to improve education in this country? And every one of those single four panellists said to her, we don't need more powers, we just need the political will and the ideas to do it. I would say that, I would, no, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, I don't, have, I don't have time this afternoon for interventions. The, we need action from the, from the SNP. They're taking out literacy, literary support in Dundee, they're taking out the early years practitioners that work in the poorest schools, um, supporting literacy and numeracy. They're taking them out to cover the 600 hours childcare pledge, and Derek Mackay and Margaret Burgess know that that is the case. The Minister talked about we're taking every opportunity to negotiate with the EU on the living wage. Again, Minister, I would say that is completely untrue. This government is prepared to take its fight on minimal alcohol pricing to the EU and see it right through, but you're not prepared, and Alex Rowley again per pinpointed perhaps a reason, the lobbying and the cost of that commitment to the living wage, that actually you're not prepared, despite advice from the Commission Office and the EU spokespeople to say, that actually it is, we could put it in the procurement bill and the rules allow it. But this government is not prepared to put its money where its mouth is and support that living wage. And it is just wrong for the minister to suggest that they are. And I would also turn to our pledge on cutting corporation tax. Final 25 seconds. It is the only pledge, it is the only tax pledge in the white paper. They talk about poverty, but there are no pledges on tax policy for anyone but business. How about income tax? How about tax credits? How about personal allowance? Any tax pledges or even ideas for working people? Not one. And on my final point, presiding officer, 
Energy bills dropped £100 by under Ed Miliband as Energy Minister. And John McAlpine was Disclose, clearly please. not in the chamber that day, the day the Minister Fergus Ewing reacted to Labour pr proposals for an energy price fees. That regulation well was done. anathema. Thanks very the SNP much. should be now taking call action. On Margaret Burgess, up six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There certainly has, um, I can't say it's been the most uh, consensual of debates we've had in this chamber, um, but what I would say is that there is certainly a consensus, certainly I, I'm not going to include uh, our Tory colleagues in this, in terms of the gap that is there between the rich and the poor, and that we have to do uh, something about it to tackle it. And I, I'll take on a couple of the points that was made. I, I think I would refer to what Joan McAlpine said when she said, uh, uh, and like her, you know, I'm amazed when I listen to some of the things that we're hearing from the Labour Party, they're suggesting there as if they have never had an opportunity within UK or within the Scottish Parliament to do something about it. The, the income gap and the wealth gap is widening, and that is happened under consecutive... No, I'm not, take, I'm not taking an intervention at this point. At this point. And the, the gap is widening and has continued to widen under successive Westminster governments. They are not dealing with it properly. And I want to say a bit <laughs> about... There was a mention of the minimum wage. And the, prop, the reason why we have a minimum wage and a living wage is because the minimum wage was set too low and successive... Win, uh, successive so the minimum wage was set too low and successive Westminster governments haven't kept up in line with inflation, yep. which is something yep. the Scottish <laughs> Government uh, and an independent yep. Scotland would do. And that's why we've got people that are not... A, a minimum wage that people can't live off, which is a disgrace. And that's a Westminster policy. They're responsible for that. Yep. And I'll say again, and I'll say it as clearly as I can, this Scottish Government is absolutely committed to the living wage and promoting the living wage. And we have set that, we have set by example. Yeah. Well, we have done. We have, got, we have legal advice which has been published telling us that we can't put it in the face, make it mandatory in the procurement bill. But the Deputy First Minister has made it absolutely crystal clear what our intention is in terms of the living wage and how that will be addressed in Stage 3 amendments. There will be no doubt among uh, local authorities and those procuring for uh, public contracts what the position of the Scottish Government is in a living wage. And I absolutely refute everything that Alec Rowley said in that and suggested Absolutely. that we were doing it because we've been lobbied in some way. That is simply not true. And we support a living wage. Yeah. Absolutely support it. We will also maintain uh, um, the, the minimum wage and increase it in line with inflation, as we would do with tax credits other, and other social security benefits, which has not happened in the past there was some criticism from the, the Conservative benches about our position in terms of tax, that we have no, um, nothing laid out in tax. Unfortunately, I've got six minutes at the moment, but I will refer the, the member. There are a whole section in the white paper in Scotland's future about how we will, our position in terms of a tax system in Scotland. We set out very, our early priorities, which focus on fairness and economic growth. We are absolutely committed to building... I'll give way in one to one. Uh, I'll give yeah, way as I was talking about. Concerns. Just specifically, yeah, what what changes would be made to income tax as early priorities? If um, if. Um, Gavin Brown is wanting me to say what the rate will be set at. That will be for future Scottish governments. Yeah. What I will say is that we are committed to building a tax system which stimulates the economy, builds uh, social cohesion, sustains Scotland's public services, and as I said earlier, the Institute of Fiscal Studies say a new nation, a new state designing a new system can only be better. We can make savings in that, and we can certainly do something about the tax avoidance that's currently happening, yeah. and we'll deal with that as as well. So full fiscal responsibility would allow key decisions and taxations. I've got two minutes left. I think that's a no, Mr Smith. Just sit down, please. I've got two minutes left, and I've given way in both times exactly. during the debate more than any other exactly. member gave in their speaking. Um, so the current uh, UK tax system is complex, costly, and independence would allow us to design a simple, simpler and cheaper system. But we heard a lot from Willie Rennie and from the Conservatives, his, his Conservative colleagues, about uh, the, the, one, the tax credits and what they're doing in terms of low pay and tax. 
but the UK Treasury's own analysis shows that households will be worse off as a result of changes to taxation, benefits and public spending implemented by the UK Government. And that's their own um, analysis. The average household will be the equivalent of £757 worse off in 2015-16 as a result of cuts to public services, benefit reforms and tax changes already announced by this UK Government and due to be implemented. On the same basis, households at the very bottom income quintile will suffer cuts equivalent to £814 um, a, a year. So, all of what we're hearing uh, from, from the UK government is what they're doing. They're giving it in one way and it's gone in the other way and the poorer are becoming worse off. And that's their own analysis is, is showing that. So I, I would finish by saying that, yes, I would agree that wealth re redistribution alone is not enough to introduce uh, inequality. But Scotland's future sets out a broad approach to tackling inequality. There is a political will from this party and this government to do that. We want to help people move into sustained work and support people to develop skills and the progress that will help all that will help support better solidarity you need to close and cohesion Minister. in Scotland. So at that point, I would just say what I said earlier on: the only independence will help us build a fairer and more prosperous Scotland, where we finally eradicate inequality and poverty. I now call on Patrick Harvey to wind up the debate. Mr Harvey, I can give you till 5.30. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to thank members for their contributions. Apparently, I'm an authoritarian socialist and also not radical enough for a Liberal Democrat. <laughs> Maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Um, I'd like to begin by giving credit where credit's due. Margaret Burgess, uh, in her opening remarks, uh, did give, for example, a staunch defence of universal services, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. She talked about the National Performance Framework, and the Scottish Government's National Performance Framework does make steps in the direction of a broader measure of economic success than simply growth. Uh, not as much as I would like, but steps in the right direction, and I, and I welcome that. She said very clearly that she believes the Westminster system has failed and won't deliver in the future. But when challenged by Gavin Brown to say what income tax changes the SNP would implement, she didn't have specifics to offer. As she said, and she repeated again at the end of her closing speech, only independence can deliver the change that we need. No, no. Political will. If we have the political will and we don't have independence, we can only do little. But if we have independence and don't have the political will, we can do nothing. We need to have both, and I implore colleagues who support independence, as I do, to recognise that it is not the only thing we need. And also, when challenged by John Finney uh, on corporation tax cuts uh, and the, the, the taxpayers' bungs for tax dodgers like Amazon, uh, I'm afraid it would be polite to say that the minister struggled. Uh, Willie Rennie did ask for something uh, more radical. I'm happy to send him a copy of the Green Party Manifesto. We can read all about the citizen's income, about a shorter working week, about land value tax, about community and public ownership. Uh, but this debate wasn't intended to be about the Green Party's manifesto. It was intended to try and seek some agreement on the principle. I, and I've, I'm sorry that if he, he doesn't care to join that agreement, I, I regret that. But it does free me up to say that if, uh, if I'm being timid, at least I'm not simply saying, please let me join up with the Tories and I'll try and give a hard right government a kind of face. John Mason pointed out that the Tory amendment is the only one that sought to delete all of the uh, motion and uh, every aspect of the argument about inequality. He's quite right. And he also made a really important argument about greed, quite rightly. It was a faith-based argument. From his perspective, that's honest, of course. But I would politely point out that religion and Christianity in particular can be advanced by him to make a good point about greed or by David Cameron to defend his government and its dismal record. Gavin Brown, I'd like to apologise to Gavin Brown for, for mishearing him. Uh, millions instead of billions, it is no small error indeed. Perhaps instead of only having a more sustainable transport policy, we might also need to put up with an end to tax avoidance and the cancellation of Trident renewal. I guess I could live with those things, though, uh, if that's what it takes to fund a welfare state that's worthy of the name. As for uh, Jackie Bailey, um, Jackie Bailey talked uh, very sincerely about l what Labour values mean to her. She said that sharing wealth is what Labour is all about. That's 
uh, what is at the core of everything they do. Now, I, I welcome that intent, and I do not doubt the sincerity of it for a moment. But just as I want my fellow independence supporters to accept that independence in itself does not give guarantees, I also want Jackie Bailey to acknowledge that nor does a Labour government. Nor does a Labour government. Let us remember those 13 years of Labour government where we saw the same continuation of corporation tax cuts that had been begun by its predecessor. There has been very little interruption in that downward graph of corporation tax cuts during Tory, Labour and coalition governments at UK level. Let us remember uh, the, the words of uh, Mr Mandelson in talking about being extremely comfortable uh, with people becoming immensely wealthy. New Labour, in 13 years of government, sought accommodation with the neoliberal model. It did not seek its defeat. And I think that's the most important point uh, to remember. So we need the political will. We need the political will, whether you seek to change the UK government or change the constitution. Neither in itself gives a guarantee uh, of success. Last year, last year, uh, I hear from behind me a heckle that there's no guarantee in much of what we do in, in life, if that's of, of success in much of what we do in life. Absolutely, absolutely. This debate should be one about opening up the possibilities, giving ourselves the chance to make progress toward a fairer and more equal society. None of us should imagine or seek to pretend that our policy on the Constitution or a change of government gives that guarantee. Last year, presiding officer, the Green and Independent debate was about the legacy of the Thatcher government. The timing was controversial, but I think apart from the Conservative uh, defence of that government, the, there was a, an acknowledgement amongst most of the chamber about the damaging effects of that legacy. But the fiercest critics, the fiercest critics in the world of the Thatcher government must acknowledge that it had a deep, profound and lasting impact. What is needed now what is needed now is nothing less. A tr political transformation every bit as dramatic, every bit as deep and every bit as lasting. Those who want to change the UK government or those who want to leave the UK, amongst whom I, I have e empathy with both objectives, but whichever objective we share, my fear is, my concern is, that it's the tribal hostility between us that could threaten our ability to deliver the kind of political transformation that our country needs when September the 19th comes around. When September the 19th comes around, we're going to have to accept the result. The, those who campaign to stay in the union, if Scotland votes yes, we're going to have to accept that we have the responsibility to take up the challenge that the Scottish people will have given us and try and achieve that political transformation. Those who are campaigning for a yes vote if Scotland votes no, we're still going to have to accept that our responsibility is to achieve as great a political progress as we can within the limits the Scottish people will have chosen to Do you need to, to wind up, Mr Harvey? Uh, can I, uh, in closing, thank once again all members for their contribution to this debate. Perhaps it's only a debate that we can properly have after September the 19th, but I'm grateful pe for people having at least engaged with it beforehand. That concludes the debate on wealth, land, income equality. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9941 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should replace the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 9941. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 9941, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9942, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable for the Housing Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 9942. Moved. 
No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the motion to the chamber. The question is, motion number 9942, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 9943 on approval of an SSI, motion number 9944 on parliamentary recess dates, and motion number 9945 on the office of the clerk. Moved on block. Question on these motions will, become, will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are 11 questions to be put as a result of today's business, so you need to pay attention. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate on energy and climate change, if the amendment in the name of John Swinney is agreed, the amendments in the name of Ian Gray and Murdo Fraser fall? The first question then is amendment number 9927.3. In the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion number 9927 in the name of Alison Johnson on energy and climate change be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9927.3 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 65. No, 16. There were 37 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to, and the amendments in the name of Ian Gray and Murdo Fraser fall. The next question is that motion number 9927 in the name of Alison Johnson as amended on energy and climate change be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment on motion number 9927 in the name of Alison Johnson as amended is as follows. Yes, 114. No, 4. There were no abstentions, so therefore the motion as amended is agreed to. The next question is amendment number 9926.3 in the name of Margaret Burgess, which seeks to amend motion number 9926 in the name of Patrick Harvey on wealth and income inequality be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9926.3 in the name of Margaret Burgess is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 58. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 9926.1 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend motion number 9926 in the name of Patrick Harvey on wealth and income inequality be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on amendment number 9926.1 in the name of Jackie Bailey is as follows. Yes, 43. No, 75. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 9926.4 in the name of Gavin Brown, which seeks to amend motion number 9926 in the name of Patrick Harvey on wealth and income inequality be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9926.4 in the name of Gavin Brown is as follows. Yes, 16. No, 101. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9926 in the name of Patrick Harvey as amended on wealth and income inequality be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 9926 in the name of Patrick Harvey is as follows. Yes, 64. No, 54. There have been no abstentions, so the motion, as amended, is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9943 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed to. Are we all, all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9944 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on parliamentary recess dates be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 9945 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the office of the clerk be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.